Microdose Monthly Webcast. Thank you for joining us. Um, as we are heading into autumn, heading into wetter times, heading into more fungal times for many of us, I'm broad- broadcasting tonight from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and would like to pay my respects to Elders past and present as well as anybody who might be tuned in today or to the recording of this broadcast in the future. Um, I'd also like to recognise that we benefit, um, especially in this community, but really all communities, if you think of our original technology as plants and how we can interact with plants, um, we benefit from the knowledge and insights of First Nations people here in Australia and First Nations people around the world. Uh, Their long relationship with plants and fungi is the basis for a lot of our original technologies from which we have grown um, everything, uh, pretty well everything. Um, If you know, by the way, what country you are on, I'd love for you to drop it into the uh, chat. So please do drop that into the... Oh, I'm just looking. How many many viewers? We've got a few of you here uh, live tonight. So if you do know uh, where you're where you're joining us from tonight please do uh, drop it in there it's always uh, nice to know and as i said we are live so it's good to good to um start some conversation introduce yourself to uh the other commenters who are here live my name is nick wallace i'm the founder of the australian psychedelic society and currently uh heading up the melbourne chapter uh, i've also spent the past decade volunteering and working in harm reduction in a variety of capacities and i'm uh, personally pretty passionate um about not just seeing an end to this drug war um but also growing um growing and seeing this vibrant community that i see that exists uh come out from uh the stigma the shame the the criminalization that currently happens to uh to uh too many people within this community um that's what i'd like to see i'd like to see that not even be part of our conversation anymore because we don't have to worry about it um and for people to be able to actually do the things that they love doing and express their passion so that's you know that's my dream might be a bit lofty but uh hopefully a few of you resonate as well uh, EGA provides opportunities for critical thinking and knowledge sharing at the meeting ground between plants, fungi, mind and culture and is the perfect place for you to meet like-minded people and to have these discussions. Um, uh, EGA uh, embrace the psychedelic in the absolute broadest sense uh, by... Um, uh, by uh, bringing together the science, culture, policy and uh, nurturing the grassroots community that holds all of this together. Uh, and I'm going to bring up uh, the EGA website now because there's a couple of updates that I want to uh, share with you. So let's just jump across to those. Oh. So this is the EGA website right now. So if you if you jump across to Entheogenesis uh, Australis, or, um, geez, it's a mouthful, entheogenesis.org, there's a few other domain names that you can get to it, you'll notice this. This is um, the landing page that is currently, uh, currently there, uh, and it will tell you what's going on, but I'll also mention it. There is a new website that will be launched soon. This is for EGA as the broad overall organisation. Um, and I hear, although I'm not privy to the deeper depth details of what's going on but i hear that it's quite a surprise that they have uh lined up and quite a uh, quite a website that we are going to be seeing so watch this space but if you go to gardenstates.org which is the conference uh website then you'll get this which you are probably more familiar with this is where um the ega domain has been pointing for a little while um now the really important thing to do here especially if you're interested in coming along to Garden States from the 2nd till the 4th of December, which is the first in-person event for EGA in quite some time, um, as it has been for many organisations, um, then you want to click here to register and you'll be taken to this screen, uh, which is where you can register your interest. And I've been told that tickets will be back on sale very very soon no date yet but i'm hearing very very soon so when i'm hearing things like this vague um and i want to keep up to date then you bypass the vagueness by keeping connected get in touch ega newsletter sign up jump over to this page sign up for the newsletter and that way uh coming soon means that it's straight in your inbox as soon as that um arbitrary length of time actually uh comes to its end confolds i don't think that's a word but it makes sense right now um so confold it into your inbox confold and put it into your confolder into your entheogenesis confolder and then you will uh no longer be confounded i guess um 
while we're here, you can also, if you are interested in presenting something at the conference, you can put in a... Were we just still talking about expressions of interest? I was looking at, at it just before. Uh, hmm. No, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to instead invite you to, um, if you are interested in presenting something on one of the EGA webcasts, which we do monthly on the last Friday, uh, last Wednesday, usually last Wednesday of every month. I realise tonight is a Thursday, but we make exceptions at times. Uh, um, and if you have something interesting that you want to present, or if you know somebody who has something interesting um, that they might like to present, then you can uh, send in an expression of interest for that under webcast EOI and you can just fill in those details send that through to us and then we'll get in touch with you so that's those updates uh, tonight tonight we have um, quite a uh, big special for you um, we have uh, quite uh, a, a long uh, piece from our friends up at Nimbin Nimbin um, being the sort of um, uh, countercultural capital of Australia, and I think um, it's still fair to call them the countercultural capital of Australia, um, being the home of the, or at least the, the found home. I did discover a whole history of it, um, beginning at a university in Canberra and then a move, um, eventually moving up to uh, Nimbin, being sort of the, the chosen grounds uh, for um, the Aquarius Festival, and there were some other festivals, and this was in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. Um, really interesting tales. I'm not going to get into all of those. There's actually a, a video that you can go and check out. Um, it was a, a, a conference, uh, no, it was a forum at Rainbow Serpent Festival in like 2018 if you want to know the history of why Nimbin ended up as the countercultural capital, but they are. We're going to be hearing from them. And of course, it has been um, difficult times for all of our friends up in the Northern Rivers region and for those in Queensland as well with a lot of flooding going on. So I hope everyone is feeling um, okay now. Um, and with that, Mardi Gras has been postponed. Mardi Gras is the pro Protestful, um, the protestful that is uh, has been all about uh, cannabis uh, reform and rethinking how we approach cannabis uh, for a long time. So we're going to be hearing from uh, our friends at Nimbin to hear all the updates on the Mardi Gras cannabis law reform protestful um, and take a trip down memory lane and discuss some of the highs and lows uh, of this as well. We will also be hearing from Liam, our regular um, for EGA. I think you've uh, Liam, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at him you're not looking at him so I'm not going to like I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep the conversation directed at here but um, almost every second uh, EGA webcast recently we've had some updates from Liam and he's been uh, furiously producing all sorts of interesting content um, for you so we will have that for you soon as well um, and uh, one other thing for anybody that might be uh, in the Sydney area especially in the Wollongong area um, but I know that you Sydney siders can make it down to Wollongong it's not too far um, there is this weekend a um, an event on uh, that I've just where did I put it spoilation facebook.com uh, forward slash spoilation <laughs> uh, I'm, I'll get somebody to drop that into uh, into the YouTube uh, comment section um, it is a curated art exhibition featuring interactive work that explores the topic of psychedelic medicine as a new mental health treatment option. Um, our friends from PRISM will be there. Our friends from ISWAS will be there. Um, some of our friends from EGA will be there. And I hear um, that uh, it will be one of the first places that will be displaying the... Um, the this, this thing. Oh, go back. There we go. This, uh, and I'm just going to flick that away again because it's still a secret. Um, that is the uh, the essentially the, the, the plant trips it chart um, that EGA has been developing um, alongside their uh, artistic partners and it is going to be quite something that's been in development for a little while um, and when it comes out um, it will be a, a really uh, uh, not, not only a great resource in terms of the information that's there but a really beautiful resource, the kind of one that you would be happy to print out in glossy, put it up somewhere prominent in your house and for it to look um, you know like 
like another piece of piece of art amongst your art. So I believe that is going to be displayed up there. So sporulation, I'll get to, uh, the, the, uh, our moderators to drop that into the comments. Now, I've been yambering on for, for long enough, so I'm going to throw over now to our friends uh, from Nimbin, and we're going to hear from them. Uh, so we've got three guests, Michael Balderstone, uh, who... <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading the first part and I'm learning new things about Michael uh, all the time. And apparently, and like, I'm just, I'm just going to read it out, but apparently Michael abandoned a successful career as a stockbroker to look for a deeper meaning uh, in his life. And Michael, I'd love to know, is this is this one of the, is this a furphy? Is this a, a, ball, a baldery? Or is this, were you really were getting into the... Uh... No, it's a true story. No, story. JB Weir and son, I was a you know, bright-eyed boy in London and just helping the rich get richer and started thinking about it. Oh, excellent. That is the perfect uh, beginning point. So Michael Balderstone, uh, ready for the um, finance world and the capitalists and uh, changed his uh, changed his mind, moved to Nimbin 30-odd years ago and has been involved with the Hemp Embassy and Mardi Gras since it began. Uh, he is also president of the federally, uh, federally registered political party, the Legalised Cannabis Party, uh, which I believe was formerly the Hemp Party, although these things get very... Very confusing, especially the closer you follow them. I'm sure uh, it's like the, the the less you know because it's like wow, this is very confusing. But uh, it's a, it's a cannabis party. Um, uh, there have been uh, some elections made, I believe, for the legalized cannabis party. A um, couple of members up in in WA, possibly one in Queensland as well. Michael is passionate about injustice in all forms, but in particular the war on drugs. Believing drug use should be a health issue and not a fight over who gets to profit from pain. Ms. Guidance, who is is our, uh, well, at least somebody that I have regularly spoken to and received uh, updates from, uh, especially when I was uh, on 3CR uh, presenting in Psychedelia. Uh, Ms. Guidance uh, has attended Mardi Gras since the late 90s, and in 2011, Ms. Guidance started helping with the conference um, and uh, the hemposium part of the conference. Ms. Gardens also volunteers at the Nimbin Hemp Embassy and is a member of Entheogenesis Australis. And um, uh, we do have quite a number of members of EGA who are also located in that area. So that's, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a, it's really is a, an across Australia network. There are people uh, from all parts of Australia. And finally, Neil Pike, musician, video maker, lifetime activist and uh, professional weirdo. Um, Neil is an active proponent of optimistic cynicism that's trademarked with a capital O and a capital C uh, and lives in the rainforested hippie warrens surrounding the rural Australian town of Nimbin raised by peace activists in the 50s and 60s he's been making music and causing trouble since the early 70s involving himself in a range of causes from environmental protection to various social justice issues uh, Neil is the founder and grand again capitals grand authenticated bush turkey of the pagan love cult incorporated uh, probably the longest running uh, contemporary psychedelic music group in Australia. Neil's a multi instrumentalist, a singer songwriter, and he's performed at gigs and festivals extensively all around the world. The best thing. <laughs> Neil says, the best thing about being the grand authenticated bush turkey is that only other turkeys take you seriously. So, <laughs> without further ado, um, because that's too many adieus, um, here it is. <laughs> Here we are today uh, to talk about, I guess, one of the most enduring and famous and uh, amazing drug law reform uh, festivals in the world. Protest. Sorry, protest. Protestable, uh, maybe. Of protest. course, protestable. Otherwise, we're paying for the police. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, festivals. Yeah, exactly. We have to make sure our definitions are right. And, and I guess protestable is really the name of the game because mm. uh, so much of the Mardi Gras program is all about, indeed, protesting these insane drug laws. And I know that, uh, you know, prohibition has been around in various forms now for like 100 years or more. So I think, uh, you know, it's now getting to the point uh, where people are being uh, agitators. It's generational now. Mm. You know, families sure. um, for many generations have had to deal with this. Uh, I know that the flavour of the times is uh, people uh, sort of screaming about freedom when it comes to lockdowns and, 
you know, uh, pandemics and whatever. But I, I can't help but reflect that uh, definitely people protesting against drug laws and prohibition has been going on for a long time. So I'd like to think that uh, Mardi Gras is really part of the original freedom fighters. Mm. And in fact, if we probably had uh, managed to change consciousness in regards to changing the laws, that maybe uh, things wouldn't have been as bad during the pandemic. It's almost like uh, the pointy, the pointy edge of community activism and so yeah Mardi Gras and Nimbin has been part of that mm. so um, I, I was going to say a great way to sort of I guess get going with um, talking about the history of Mardi Gras is not just the last 30 years but we probably need to go back to the early 70s and to the Aquarius Festival, and even prior to that, because cannabis, um, of course, has been a thing in this area even before the Aquarius Festival, right? You know, Mullumbin... Certainly an integral part of the whole hippie yeah, movement. Yeah, there was a hippie movement here, not in Nimbin so much, but... Oh. <laughs> Killer! Ah, damn funny. New World Order's caught up to me. Yeah, if, um, if everyone could turn their phones off... I'm going to stop a Five feet long, mighty immense but not too strong. You'll be high but not for long. If you's a viper, I'm the king of everything. I gotta be high. So yeah, the prehistory of Mardi Gras is the history of the Northern Rivers, mm. and I guess uh, you know people arriving and starting to build alternative communities. And it, it almost seems like prohibition has been a way for which people can be harassed. Absolutely. And, yeah, and that definitely has been something that's been going on for a long time before Mardi Gras. And I think that's what probably galvanised the beginning of Mardi Gras, wasn't it, Bob? Big year of helicopter raids, everyone just sick of it, feeling picked on like we were. De decade of helicopter raids. Yeah, yeah, and it was, you know, just, just a step too far, and I think Bob in particular been drumming up the idea for a while, and yeah, let's, let's, yeah. let's go on May the 1st as traditional protest day, May Day. Yeah, the day of the workers. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, you know, for instance, I think Bob started the Nelly Normal Nimbin in the late 80s. Yeah. Uh, so there was growing resistance to basically the way prohibition was treating the local community. Yeah. I mean, I think, too, you've got to you put it in a historical context, talking about like the Northern Rivers in the yeah. early 70s, but also just the anti Vietnam War Today. era in the late 60s, early 70s. There was quite a few examples of like. Um, extreme civil disobedience where basically people that have been arrested by the cops be they draft dodgers or drug users at the Aquarius Festival the, pal the, the paddy wagons are surrounded by, by freaks and the cops let them go so that you know that, that happened in, in early 70s I think in Sydney Uni with a, drug, with a few places with draft dodgers getting busted by the feds or the cops and all the students just gathering around the paddy wagon and getting them out get some bolt cutters away they go same thing happened at the Aquarius Festival with someone that got busted for drugs, a whole bunch, of, they, they let him go. Eventually he handed himself in later on, but it was a really stone-cold, obvious realisation that actually you don't have to do it, that civil disobedience and the overall tradition of activism had a place to play within the drug war, because as you said, it was always used as a way to fuck with the hippies. And the hippies grew out of drug use. Really, it was, in, you know, it, LSD, weed, If you look at the history of it, absolutely. Yeah, it created, absolutely. you know, we all had these, you know, for me, like spiritual experiences, mm. a whole new reality. Yeah. And really, Nimbin is part of that, but the Northern Rivers, people coming up here in the late 60s. Early 70s, and then with the Aquarius Festival yeah. in 73, Nimbin, yeah. like it or not, has become yeah. like one of the last living survivors. Mm. The, and, then we, and then we became an easy target. I mean, yeah. I wasn't living here then, but visiting, and it was infamous. Easy target, mm. stood out like a sore yeah. thumb. The hippies, fish in a barrel. Yeah, it was. And easy pickings, training ground for cops and helicopters. Nice little holiday. Mm. 
<laughs> yeah. And they say Byron Bay. It was famous, yeah. paid for, you know, great holiday. And and, and, yeah. and the helicopter, you know, my experience of helicopters over your house is fucking scary. Kids are screaming. It totally is like those Vietnam War movies right. we've all just seen. Animals go ballistic. Yeah. yeah the, the, the natural reaction of any mammal on the planet to a helicopter hovering overhead is to run around in little circles and shit yourself, yeah. basically. Yeah. It's a, it's a nightmarish, yeah. deep-rooted fear, yeah. fight, fight or flight reaction. Mm. Something to do with the subs, I suspect, and the helicopter blades. Sub, sub, sub. And it's National Party country. They don't give a shit. Mm. They fully support. So we were laughing stock, really. So the police were mounting these raids on Nimbin, and people were getting very, very upset about this. And so we decided to hold a rally, just a a gathering of the local community who would speak with one voice, who would speak in unison, who would have a state of uh, not being fearful. It was an empowerment ritual. This was a rally to support drug law reform. It was going to be a protest rally walking up the street from, uh, from the Bush Theatre down there at the bottom of the hill. In, uh, in Cullen Street, down there at the other side of the bridge, getting together in the car park. And then with a huge array of instruments of all sorts and shapes uh, put together by Donato and I think Tonya as well. And all these people with trumpets and cymbals and pots and pans marched all the way up to the police station chanting free the weed let it grow legalize it and all the other things you chant when you're chanting to legalize cannabis we had musicians brass instruments there was the donkey with the sign on its back that said the law is an ass michael balderstone had uh, made the first of the big joints which was carried along <laughs> to actually have that initial protest, you know, do that march. It was, it's great and a bit of a feeling of, hey, we can stand up for ourselves, just like you were saying. Yeah. With the early yeah, protests. And, and so, empowerment, yeah. uh, people power, mm. like understanding that when uh, bunches of people come together, you can usually, you know, affect some kind of a change, even if it's, for instance, making sure someone who's being arrested is being freed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, you know, on that... On that it's level. empowering. Yeah. It's um, empowering and it's also reassuring. You think you're out, you know, you're a weird yep. pot smoker. Suddenly you meet a thousand and others who aren't mad at all thinking like you think it's it's reassuring and yeah. confidence building for people yeah that first Mardi Gras as I remember we had such a good time it's like we're doing this every year so that's how it started yeah it becomes very inspiring as well yeah. to to keep it going yeah it's um I guess for many people in Australia they might be shocked to know that for many decades um, there's like this paramilitary response to drug use in a certain part of the country. Like, um, you know, to have helicopters hovering over your home. This is Australia, everybody. Mm -hmm. This is Australia, everybody. What, since the 80s? When did they start? With, well, since uh, the 70s, really. Yeah, if since you the want to 70s. Look at the, the, many decades. Historic, 1976, massive raid on Tunnel Falls, massive raid on Cedar Bay. Tunnel fours, they didn't use choppers, they used cattle trucks, loaded everybody up, took them back to Lismore, ran around the block a few times with everybody in the back of the cattle truck to sort of show all the locals what they've captured. captured. Yeah. And My in God. North Queensland, like they come in on trials. naval yes. boats with helicopters and fucking just full bore military, paramilitary operation, burnt their houses down, cut out all the fruit trees everybody had grown, burnt a whole lot of people's possessions, found a handful of sea lions. That's what Gross. Yeah, Did so you see the 420 last week in Melbourne? 
and like 30 to 50 police just smashed people. One guy waited for one guy to light up a joint. He was a legal mm. medical guy, but you're not allowed to smoke outside. No. Just smashed him down, carried him away. Like 30 to 50 cops, full on battle gear. Yeah. That's last week in Melbourne. Yeah, it's so like... That's, um, that's yeah. the nature of the state. I mean, it's, it's always been like that. I mean, there's been a lot of verbal complaints about police state and fucking you know, blah 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 in the last couple of years with the pandemic but the reality is for a certain class of the population for a certain level of the population and it's racially based and it's culturally based and it's financially based um, <laughs> you get fucked over yeah you do you're not a free citizen you don't have any rights they just come in and they kick the door in and they grab you and they take you off if you're black they'll probably shoot you yeah it's very, the drug war so is so much a class know. war. It always has been. Yeah, it's, it's, it always has been. The jails a lot of the people that have been war. howling about freedom in the last few months have never actually experienced that. Mm. They've never actually had the jackboot of authority on the back mm. of their neck just because they look different or they are different mm. or whatever the fuck. Mm. And, and that's the reality that, well, you know, some of us have had that our whole lives. I like that Nim and Cruz through the pandemic because we're so used to being bullied and oppressed and it was yeah, no yeah. big deal. No big deal. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah, that's great. You know, I mean, fill the security cameras with a mask on easily. Yeah. Change your walk slightly. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Couldn't yeah, make well, it well, mate. Uh, well, at least won't coming near you. You might be infected. <laughs> Absolutely, it was true. Like uh, the fact of um, having to wear masks was great because suddenly you were anonymous if you were protesting, <laughs> right? Precisely. So, so for instance, um, even if I had been against wearing masks, I would have worn a mask at the protest. Mm. You know, it's a smart thing to do. And, and I guess if we want to talk about repression, uh, Indigenous peoples have been uh, yep. totally overrepresented when it comes to yeah. using the drug war to um, to really, yeah, to destroy hammer, their hammer lives. Only numbers in jail, yeah. Aboriginal people 30 times more than white people. It's just disgusting. And most of that would be to do with drug... Uh, drug-related. It's all yeah. drug-related, you know, and... You know, the violence that's now happening in the cities, big gangs, you know, it's all drug-related. People forget illegal drugs is the biggest turnover on the planet, money-wise, along with armaments, and they're all mixed up. Mm. But, you know, it's incredible. This election at the moment, no-one wants to talk about it. None of the big parties want to talk about it because they're all scared they'll be seen as soft on drugs. So... You know, the, the, incredible to me how reefer madness has worked so well. Partic it. Particularly in Australia, yeah. because I know that we're talking about Mardi Psychosis, Gras in Melbourne. Go mad. But we're, you know, I guess now, 30 years down the track, mm. uh, we're in a, an international environment where mm. reefer madness is sort of drifting off into the, you mm. know, the void. Mm. Um, and yet Australia is still, yeah, 420, let's um, have 30 cops arrest one person mm. with a joint. Yeah, the over... I don't know, it's... Well, we have no Bill of Rights, you know, and it's ironic We're to me that... Common. America started the, the whole drug war and ironic. Yeah, you the know, ones that are winding that a few back. states there yeah. now have got weed out and suddenly after 20 years... You know, what are they saying, Colorado? Domestic violence, suicides and deaths from car accidents are all down about 30%. And that's... What, what more evidence do you need? But morons here, we, you can't even get it on the agenda. Yeah. So that's why we're doing a political thing, just to try to get heard a bit. Which is all that Mardi Gras has been about, hasn't it? Trying to get heard, Look, trying to educate it, people. Yeah, the whole... It, its roots were very, very clearly grown out of traditional political protests. Yeah. Well, you know, not political, socio-political yeah. protests, rallies, yeah. marches, you know, the May Day. Yeah. The whole principle is that the numbers of the people yeah. are strong. Yeah. You know, and it was all about protest. And, it, I mean, I think we've done really well to maintain that focus, just given the, the very nature of cannabis. And also, and who so wants to march and say, yeah, I'm a criminal? So a couple of times we tried to have gatherings in Sydney and nobody turns no, up. All the cops are there filming yeah. everyone. Yeah. So it's like you can do this in Nimbin. You're expected to smoke pot in Nimbin. <laughs> yeah. So anywhere else it's very hard to create some resistance. Yeah, I'm a criminal every day, you know. So, Once yeah. again, there's no culture of resistance. No. You know, where there, no. there is within the, the greater arc of fucking mm. alternative mm. history and, and mm. yeah anti-war history or, or environmental, uh, yeah, protest environmental protests. Environmental I mean, protests, yeah. Big goals struck locally 
um, with the nightcap and with a whole range of forests and with the whole environmental agenda in the 70s and 80s and 90s um, and, to, to, you know, and onwards. It's absolutely pioneering um, as far as protests yeah, go and, and getting heard and making a difference. Yeah, and, and it's like that's actually a, a tradition within the culture of civil disobedience or yeah. NVDA they call it these days, non-violent direct action. Yeah. And then like. somehow to turn it into fun, yeah, which, you know, to, uh, the old yeah. old when injustice becomes yeah. or resistance from duty, I think you stroke that out and put fun, fun. It's, it's, which yeah. is a good plan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're talking cultural baggage. Hey, we're fucking hippies, and it's all about Enjoy. is it fun? Yeah. If, it, if it's not fun, let's not do it. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh, the theatre of protest, the circus. It's yeah, it's definitely a great way to get people involved as mm. well. Mm. And you want them to enjoy it. They're going to come yourself. if they have a good time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, the one thing I've noticed over the years with Mardi Gras, with the like, I guess the focus of Mardi Gras for the weekend is the protest rally and parade on the and march. Yeah, yeah. On, usually on the Sunday. And the Aboriginal people usually lead that? They always lead it now. There's a smoking ceremony at the beginning, local Gilbert, local Aboriginals, and, you know, they lead the march and, you know, they're just victims. They're the ones copying it worst on the drug war. Anyway, Mardi Gras, tell you about Mardi Gras, it is about education. I mean, we're trying to change people. You're trying to get them to rethink the bullshit mm. they've been mm. taught. And I think, in, you know, in time, Nimbin and Mardi Gras has done lots on that, you know? Yeah, like, I, I've noticed some, because there's been, uh, in the last few years, people have uh, refound old footage um, and digitised mm. old videos. Mm. So it's been wonderful to mm. see some of the footage from the early days, mm. uh, including the first gathering where, indeed, there was talks in the town hall yeah, yeah. And, and I love that because um, as we know that has been an enduring part of Mardi Gras is mm-hmm. indeed you know speakers from all around mm-hmm. the world, all around Australia local, yeah just people that have got um, an immense amount of knowledge through so many different um, subjects and backgrounds on mm-hmm. cannabis it's, um, it is an amazing mm-hmm. culture and I noticed too, like back in the 90s, so, you know, Mardi Gras was this fledgling, um, you know, protest. But um, some the major, Americans got onto it. Yeah, some the ama- Americans yeah, got yeah, onto so it. Ed had, Rosenthal came no. out here. Changed the way we all grew weed. Dennis, Dennis Pe- Perron. Ron, yeah, like these major yeah. people that were part of activism in America yeah. noticed very quickly. Yeah, right. So Jack well Harrell. done. Jack Herrera, yeah. he was great. And this is, yeah. uh, this is prior to the internet being a really big thing, mm. so... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I was impressed by how switched on they were to get here. Yep. And then, of course, since then, we've had, uh, you know, doctors like Dr. Behrman come mm. uh, from overseas. We've had famous glass blowers come and speak. Um, yeah, it's been like a bit of a parade of all sorts of amazing people. It's changed because the talks, the talks now uh, can be much more open and it's lots of doctors, yep. like half a dozen doctors talking at the Mardi Gras program this year and a lot of them are already prescribing and giving out weed. and So, you know, it's changed, but it's just even more disgusting for me because we argued forever this is great medicine, no, 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 it's not they finally, it took epileptic children to get them to acknowledge yeah, it's okay medicine now you can get it through a doctor imported from Canada, all grown indoors, you know, and we're not allowed to grow our own yeah. and we're not allowed to drive, so it's actually got worse no, for look, me. The, the corporati- corporatisation of the whole, I mean legalisation, who would have thunk it? Decriminalisation was probably a better model just to remove the penalties and not try to set up a fucking systematised yeah. way of dealing it and taxing it. Just I don't know, leave it alone. Because it is a herb. Yeah. And and, and sadly what's happening with, with, with legal cannabis and indeed with the medicalisation of psychedelics in recent years is that the corporates are just come down money. Like, like money. Kind of bricks money is a ruling now. factor. And it's not like anyone that's actually grown pot in the past is going to get much of a look in. 
you know. No. And to, Except the, to, the, to the industry, the nature no. of the industry. That's you have a criminal record, mate. Yeah, yeah. see you later. I love that in a couple of states in America, they've prioritised yeah, people, the people who have been, who've been yeah. busted, gave them the licences first. That's, that's what should happen that's here. That's sort of how it should be. Yeah, can yeah. you imagine in a better world, Indigenous people would be the first to get these licences yeah. and yeah. the other start yeah, businesses. Yeah. And, great idea. Yeah, but um, I know poor old Australia, yeah. we're even way behind. When you say in the yeah. US, I notice, I want to think, one of the African countries that had introduced medical Soto, cannabis were doing a similar thing of, you know, people that have suffered world. from drug war. Yeah. yeah as in, you, our, our health minister said, we're going to supply the world. We're going right. to be the biggest supplier. I remember that. We're always the biggest. They can all just see money in it. <laughs> yeah. And I reckon most people wake up in the morning and they just think, how do we make money? Yep. They're just playing Monopoly. Mm. So everyone just looks so much money in weed. You know, so it's tall. I just think our health, and it is a, drug use is just totally a health issue for me, just people trying to have a good day, trying to feel good, have less pain. Yeah. It's got to be somehow in the not-for-profit realm. Otherwise, people are blinded. The, the, the yeah. dollar's blind yeah. people. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Look, I mean, <laughs> probably the most critical thing that could be achieved that would would see that through to fruition somehow would be just the, the legal right to grow a dozen plants. Yes. Right? To be able to go, okay, yeah. I've got the legal right to grow this many plants yeah. in my backyard yeah. for myself for, for medical reasons, you know? It's a herb. Because it is. It's a fucking herb. You can yeah. grow it in your backyard. You can grow enough probably to keep yourself stoned most of the time. Yeah. You know, and maybe, you know. It's an absolute fact. You know, Aussies in their big backyards, yeah. even the balcony on your unit, yeah, well, even that, under a light in your lounge yeah, exactly. room, everyone can grow their own medicine. Yeah. Uh, it could be a CBD plant yeah. or a THC plant. Yeah. You don't have to get stoned. Yeah. You don't have to heat it. Yeah. This is this is too much for people to think there's a plant like this that, you know, not going to cost you anything, this medicine. Mm. That's an incredible mm. thing. If we, if we can make that happen, it would be awesome. Um, but there's such a disconnect with uh, law enforcement. Like, so medical cannabis has been legal in Australia since February 2016, and yet last week at 4.20 in Melbourne, 30 cops have to arrest a medical cannabis patient. You're not allowed to smoke outside. Yeah, yeah. but, but uh, I mean, and, and uh, no... it's, it's like such an over-the-top reaction to someone doing yeah. such a pathetic crime. Nothing's really changed. You know? Yeah, it's it, well, it's like the, the police don't seem to want to back down. Down, do they? Well, their jobs are at stake. Half their work is directly drug drug yeah, involved. It's, it's going to Half their work, <laughs> and not only do they will they lose their their work, they lose their power. Yes. And I reckon that's huge. You know, you can pull over a car and you got a Nimbin number plate. You can just search your car. Yeah. We're in the hot zone. You know, they have a right to do. What, what is it? What's it called? Suspicion, whatever. Yeah. Reasonable well, suspicion. Reasonable yeah. And yeah, so, just nonsense. being um, part yeah. of this community yeah. is, is apparently yeah. reasonable suspicion. Yeah. Well, it is. Yeah. We used to sell quite a lot of weed T-shirts. Like you're wearing, maybe. I, no one buys them much anymore. You don't want to be a target. Mm. No one, you know. The, the policing's got more and more fascist, more and more heavy. The yeah. pandemic helped. Well, and it's, people, you don't want to wear it. Generational change, too. Yeah. It's just a different world. So, like, um, you know, back to Mardi Gras speakers, that people that have come, we've had lots of doctors and professors and so on, but also uh, we've had a lot of politicians over the years. Yes. So, um, especially Greens, um, John Kay, I think, was one of the earliest was Greens. a great supporter. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, and, uh, of course, David Shoebridge. Always, and, uh, always big on Kate injustice. Kate Fairman um, and Fiona Patton. Mm. of the sex and now Reason Party, mm. a really long-time supporter. Mm. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like even despite all the different efforts we've made and even support within the political realm, yeah, the, the overwhelming uh, desire to not change in politics is, is really over the top. Like, it's, it's almost like how do you get them to start... Um, yeah, I fear sometimes, by the way, that cannabis, even though it's um, an important issue for a lot of people in this area, due indeed to how you're treated, for a lot of people it's not a big issue. No. In fact, it's a dangerous issue, you know. I always remember the... Dangerous um, politically. Yeah, the yeah. member for Coffs Harbour standing up in Parliament, they were discussing decriminalising marijuana, and he'd go, hang on a minute. 
do you want everywhere to look like Nimbin, yeah. legalised cannabis? Yeah. It was the end of the discussion. Mm. Yeah, look, I mean, there, there is a huge, you know, third of the population that really have never encountered cannabis, don't get all the things that we take for mm. granted for, for whatever, however long. The ironic part, though, is that they all know somebody who does use cannabis, mm. and they usually like them. And it's medicinally the secret's getting out to yeah. a lot of people who've got a grandmother now or yeah. someone who's crook or yeah. cancer or yeah. helps them sleep. Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. Look, it's, it's, it's a really benign herb for old people yeah, it and is. for sick people too. It takes care of all the mm. many of the symptoms and side effects of both cancer mm. and the, the therapies that are available to cure it. You know, like it, it really does help with all of that. Mm. Great sleeping medicine. Fantastic sleep. And just mm. as you get older, your body fucking hurts. So mm. many, many baby boomers that were never even interested in cannabis or that tried it briefly in the 60s or 70s have suddenly embraced it wholeheartedly because it actually makes them feel like getting up. And, and we've learned a lot of stuff. You know, if you don't get stoned, if you don't heat it, cook it or light a joint, and you don't have to smoke it, you can take yeah, tinctures, you can eat it, yeah. you can... Eat it, you can yeah. it's a, and suddenly CBD, suddenly the hemp is a useful anti-anxiety, yeah. whatever, something too. Yeah, yeah it's like, uh, you know, the uh, prohibitionists always scream about, oh, all the children will start using, uh, mm. you know, cannabis. But I think we've probably noticed since, um, you know, cannabis, medical cannabis became legal, that the big uptake has been in uh, the oldies of the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As in, yeah, really? you watch out, people in yeah. their 60s, 70s, whatever, are all busy uh, yeah. using cannabis. Getting high and cruising around their mobility skirts. <laughs> it is absurd, isn't it? One of the biggest things interesting for me about Mardi Gras has been the big change in the last, is it five or six years, since there's three roads into Nimbin and the police block them all and saliva test everyone yeah. and it just killed it it did just about killed it so now it's the, you know the hardcore people are coming you got to come in the middle of the night or a few oh, days yeah. early or, or just, find a driver you know, or, you know, you've got to be really dedicated to wanting to come to Mardi Gras yeah. because ultimately it used to be you could come there and get stoned have a good time for the weekend which is attracts a large percentage of the population. Yeah, it did. But now it's like, well, you probably can come here and, and do the protest and hang around for the weekend. You might not get stoned. That's true. Well, it's one of the hardest weekends to score in Nimbin. You, 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 you get breath tested on the way. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole breath test thing is just uh, or swabbing is a... I mean, that's one of the big stumbling blocks. Serious bullying. Well, it's, and it's just in terms of, like, the stuff's, the stuff's legal for, for medical purposes. Mm. There's a whole lot of people that use it, mm. um, including CBD, which has no psychoactive effect, theoretically. Um, and yet if you and you can get busted for driving on it. Yeah. Or for driving on it from yesterday or the yeah. day before. And yet if you've got a script for fucking morphine or an opiate, which will put you to sleep... No worries, man. That's all right. You can drive it from pharmaceuticals. We need to sort that one out in order to actually... Mm. Even have the like. I mean, okay. If you look at the history of the American, God help us, the American movement, the medical thing was a critical way that they managed to get a wedge, which then eventually grew into legal cannabis overall, for better or worse. Um, but at the same time, our big we've got the medical cannabis. It's all there. It's all blah blah. Corporations are trying to do it, but there's this stumbling block. No other country. It's no like country. the our Even driving laws. Is using the swabs has a measurement of how much. How much active THC? Okay, well, that was probably yesterday. Just fuck off. Yeah. And they basically, it's anything over 10 nanograms, 10 parts mm. per billion mm. THC, you automatically lose your licence in New South Wales for three months. So, yeah. Basically, you could have had a joint a few days ago. Mm. Yeah. So it's total yeah. bullying for me and bullshit. Yeah. And we can't get anyone to take it seriously. So the, the, the irony of it also, Mardi Gras was nearly too big for Nimbin. Yeah, there was nowhere good. to park. Yeah, it was good. wet. It was a nightmare. So, so, I, you know, like to, I can see the positive that we've got... It's become hardcore Mardi Gras. The talks are serious. If you want to come, you'll get here, yeah. like you say. Yeah. A few people have discovered the tunnel. It's pretty well hidden, though. <laughs> you can come in under the tunnel. Shh. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Don't talk about that. But, you know, it, it will survive because the drug... You know, the, the war on weed is as bad as ever because of what you're, like things you're saying. Mm. So... We'll just maintain it. It's a bit easier that it's not massive and we've got logistical nightmares of there's people parking halfway. There's a sweet spot 
in yeah. crowd numbers with any big event. In a tiny village. And, and Mardi Gras had surpassed that years yes, ago. Yes, it had. Yeah. Back to a, a really manageable yeah. last five. And, yeah, yeah and, that, and that's something we haven't really touched upon a lot, but Mardi Gras itself is unique in as mm. much as a whole little village mm. town of mm. Nimbin mm. is, is really Mardi Gras for the weekend. Uh, well, that doesn't happen very often. No, and I, I love that you know, a lot of towns have a festival, you know, Grafton has its jack around. And I love that we've got a useful festival, mm. protest about a plant, you know. It was that sense of ah, excitement, a joy of there was a palpable air of excitement that people had broken out of their fear and were stating for the first time together a community's desire to see drug law reform within Nimbin. And uh, we're here talking about the incredible uh, Mardi Gras protestable. And we got up to the point of chatting about really some of the, I guess, exceptionally interesting uh, events that are part of Mardi Gras, which uh, really came from what greater and greater numbers of people coming to Nimbin and really looking at ways to, um, I guess, entertain as well as educate. And include them too, I reckon. So the great thing about the Hemp Olympics is, exactly. you know, show this, that image out there, stoners turn into vegetables under a banana tree, whereas we can be as active as anyone and we as sharp as anyone. Yeah, <laughs> we can do it. And, um, and you know, the pot poetry is still a goer. Pot art sort of dribbles along, doesn't it? We've the got... combi convoy has become a great event where combis start off in Byron, go to Lismore and turn up here at 4.20 on Saturday. That's an event. Things evolve and some events have come and gone a bit, but you've got to have an entertaining program. Absolutely. Well, the one nice thing about Mardi Gras is it is a bit DIY. Mm. Like there's definitely uh, a certain structure mm. is created, but often, yeah, the uh, what actually happens is a consequence of who comes and what they decide to do. Mm. So it's really lovely to have that kind of palette. Mm. And um, I was just thinking with the, uh, the Hemp Olympics in particular are brilliant because people from all around the world can easily get involved. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anything from uh, everyone, all pot smokers around the world, you know, it's important they know how to throw a bong. Well, you know, very important. Exactly. If the cops are coming, that's, you've got to get yep. the bong straight through the window. <laughs> that's right. That's so right. it's it's uh, it's distance as well as accuracy. And uh, the uh, the iron gro grower person, or the grower... Yeah, it's a, 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 it's an extremely difficult event, which, which I think uh, about the, the stupidity of prohibition. It's a plant you could grow in our backyard, and here we are, got to climb hills, crawl through lantana tunnels, get covered in leeches and ticks. Carrying water, yeah. buckets of water, yeah. So we build this lantana tunnel for the weekend and put leeches and ticks in it. It's all pretty real. You've got to carry water to the plants, then go and get the plants and come back, and uh, it's an ordeal, and you have to sign a waiver so you don't have a heart attack. But anyway, it's, hot. It, it's really made by having these two good comedians commentating the whole thing and rah, rah, rah. Yeah. But um, the oh, Comedy Convoy is a great event. I'm talking about long-standing events. The thing that we lost was the tug of drug war with the police on the big hem rope. And... Um, yeah. Yeah, that's the cops shame. would the cops would train for it, and we'd start Mardi Gras off on the Saturday with this huge tug of war, and then we couldn't beat them. And then things evolved. We learned to tie the rope onto a post in the tent, and they couldn't see the end of it, so they couldn't possibly win one year. They got pissed off. And then we did it on a hill, and they've got slippery boots, so that was a failure. Don't give so, away the secret. I know. Well, they won't do it anymore. We gave them a hard time one year. And we won fair and square twice. I know. Anyway, <laughs> but that was a great event. They, pl they take it all too seriously, the coppers. Yeah, I, I've noticed. Um, yeah, they can. The police can be very thin-skinned. Yeah. They're not. They're not out there when it comes to um, a good sense of humour, which is really what Mardi Gras is all about. Like, I guess people that have suffered under prohibition for such a long time, it's good to at least have a laugh. And they, like, they're all different. There's some good cops and shitty cops. And look, on an individual level, lots of them do have a sense of humour. 
but in their official capacity when they're working. They're not, all, they're not allowed to show Not in front it. of the not commander. Not allowed to display it. They're not allowed to um, do anything that's going to um, make the uniform look bad. It, it's in the minds of some fucking hmm. uptight commissioner or commissioner's assistant undersecretary dog fucker. I don't know, you know? And the next year they brought the riot squad. Yeah. And it was... Yeah, it was ridiculous. It was great the first few years because there, there really wasn't a police. Yeah, presence. that's right. And then, yeah, there was political shift, really. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But I, by the Sunday with the riot squad, I remember that first year. You know, they came not knowing what to expect, yeah, yeah. and you know, they came and totally out for a riot. By they Sunday the in the rally, they were just about marching with us. It was a joke. <laughs> Easiest job they'd ever had. <laughs> Right of colour, yeah. nothing else. Right. Yeah, you, no, you can see it. it the, the dawning realisation up throughout yeah. the weekend as they go. Yeah. At first, they're really antsy and patting their guns and standing there in muscular yeah. sort of positions, and then gradually they start loosening up and they. People talk to them. Some of the girls talk to them. Yeah, stone girls in yeah. little mini dresses yeah. coming up, driving around, and they, they go taking their, their photos with them. Problem. These people aren't actually trying to. Mm. bash each other up or bash up you know, mm. they just want to get started yeah the, the, the power of uh, peace and love and harmony mm. yeah. and shit. weed and I mean that is the education that hey you know it's a pretty harmless herb and yeah, it was well, educational for the cops I yeah, think well, yeah. seeing a heap of people stoned behaving okay having a good time that's right, having they, fun usually yeah. in uh, environments that yeah. alcohol yeah, so you know, fueled, yeah. yeah, every event you go to is full of alcohol, mm. and I think we've all realised and understand that to be uh, at an event where alcohol is not the preeminent thing, it mm. is a totally different, different vibe. Totally different that, and vibe. that's that's why dance parties mm. yeah. over the years have been revolutionary as yeah. well. Because um, back in the day, many of them had zero alcohol yeah. as well. Mm. So it's a different space um, for women, children, yeah. Yeah. yeah, men that aren't Everyone. into all the the macho shit. Which yeah. makes me think of um, like a big part of Mardi Gras for many years was the the dance for drug law reform. Back in the third Mardi Gras, fourth Mardi Gras, this is the early 90s or mid 90s, right? So there's a whole, if you like, sort of division or a bit of a schism happening within the culture between the older freaks and the younger freaks. And a lot of it was, funnily enough, music based. And so a lot of the younger crew were into dance culture, basically, like what, what we call in this area doof music, which is essentially an outdoor rave party. That had become an intrinsic part of the life of most of the second generation hippies, our children. And they, they were going, well, look, Mardi Gras is great, but we don't really like Neil Young all that much, or Bob Dylan, or Bob Marley even. We like doof. So can we have some doof? Can we, can we do a doof? And there wasn't a real lot of happy response from, from the older freaks, you know, just like their parents who liked Frank Sartre but hated the Rolling Stones, they didn't like, oh, that's not music, you can't dance that, you can't even understand what they're saying. That's because they're not saying anything, they're going, you know, anyway. anyway um, so they just said, fuck it. And a, a few of the younger kids, the son of Bob Hopkins, who was one of the intrinsic characters, and my son, Ron, um, so well, let's just do a doof. We'll do a renegade doof on the outskirts of town. And they organised a, a dance party that went on the Saturday night um, and, and, and drained the town, which was a good thing at midnight because you've got hospitals, you've got old people, you've got a town. Do you want a bunch of stoned, inebriated partygoers, ragers, still hanging around town at midnight? No, it's better if they actually leave town and go to a nice contained area where they can just sort of burn it out all night and dance to a repetitive beat. That's great. That's and it's like I personally, I personally, I like the culture. I kind of bunch of young people taking psychedelics, dancing to music. Sounds terribly familiar. You know? Good light shows. Um, Anyway, so they did that the first year. Once again, they got about a thousand people there. They were smart enough to then take any profit they made because they charged it at the gate and give it to the local hospital. And the following year, once again, it doubled. And they did this for quite a few years. And each year, they never they covered cost, and then they'd take the money and divide it up between, yeah, you know, the bushfire brigade, the hospital, um, local pro child care centres. Uh, the wildlife carers, you know, a whole range of worthy community-based projects. And so those guys were actually getting a slice of the financial pie that potentially Mardi Gras is for, for them. You know, a lot of people come in, they're going to have to spend their money. So 
let's see some of that money go back to the community. And that was really a, a massive effort by these young guys. More as a rebellion against not being able to have a dance party than anything else. But they were wise enough to go, well, we don't really want the money. Let's, let's, give it to, let's, let's make the town want this to happen. And sure enough, by the fifth or sixth year, um, yeah, the local community was really behind it. So that's a little known fact about Mardi Gras, with Mardi Gras and Dorf. Another part of Mardi Gras that's happened for many years that sort of uh, was really the end of the Combi Convoy was the uh, the 420 on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, Big Bong's uh, um, Stoner Blaze. Yeah, that's an event. Yeah, so that's... How many joints we could all light at once. That's was right. a world, We had the world record for that's a right. couple of weeks or something. <laughs> <laughs> And that, um, I guess, part of the fun of Mardi Gras and to keep, you know, the police guessing, a lot of those joints are, uh, what, Damiana joints? We had to live that down. It was pretty shameful. I mean, there were so many cops and we thought, we've still got to throw joints to everyone. So we rolled lots in Damiana or Mugwort, didn't we? It was, like, pretty shameful. Well, people fire them up and get very disappointed. <laughs> yeah, it was shocking. <laughs> it doesn't happen anymore. I thought we were clever. There's a lot of good stoned ideas pop up at Mardi Gras. They're not always that awesome <laughs> <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah, no, no. yeah. Um, that's uh, by the way to me that's an interesting part of Mardi Gras because it's like um, an unspoken thing that got once it's like the tunnel I I know that on this panel we're giving out a lot of um, secret the tunnel we shouldn't have talked we, about but it's yeah, okay we'll it's, just get it out yeah, there okay. <laughs> and, you know, and, and other events like the seed swap and there's lots of things that, oh, that and, the and cannabis was, cup at Mardi Gras was, was that, legendary yeah. at Mardi Gras and in, in different locations and secret and you could buy tickets in a raffle to go to it because everyone wanted to go. And it finished up with the police smashing into the wrong house in Nimbin in the middle of the night where we'd managed to fool them. It was in that. So now my, the Cannabis Cup happens on a separate weekend. So, But that was a great early part of Mardi Gras. As I remember, remember the Bush Theatre year? Well, the year that we... The Beyond so, 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 certain parties... Entered a DMT so I do the that. cannabis cup. That was that was pretty interesting. Yes. Did, did, oh, sorry. Did they win? They would, they would have been no disqualified. They would. It was a very popular, you know. Yeah. Nice yeah, well, that's, um, that's really sort of, you know, combining different uh, plant, mm. you know, plant allies there, isn't it? And making sure that you're ramping it up. Very nice. Very nice. It's interesting for me that, that mushrooms have crept into Mardi Gras, which I'm totally happy about. And really, and it's so local anyway as well. And I noticed the talks last year were packed out on psilocybin. Now it's become mainstream, interesting nowadays. So... I mean, it is, it is just about weed, and, and I've got to be careful because the legalised cannabis party, not everyone sees... Um, psychedelics as part of it. Psychedelics as part of it. But for me, the whole drug war is yeah. just shocking, mate. This is a health issue. Yeah, know? it's all drugs, isn't it? It's all drugs. It's worth saying that the first couple of Mardi Gras events were, in fact, drug law reform. Drug law reform. And cannabis law yeah. reform, and that was something that changed after a few years. Yeah, OK. Because, because of the same reason. Yeah. There's, there's people within the cannabis community yeah. who don't want to be tarred yeah. with the heroin brush, even though heroin's a far bigger social... Yeah. or was, back in the day, a far bigger social problem. Yeah. Um, I could argue The only just... way to deal with it is legalise it and let's work it out, but yeah. there's still a whole lot of people that go, no, that's smack, we don't like smack. It's cannabis we're worried about, which yeah. is fair enough, but it's a little bit... It's bullshit. It's yeah, just not, it's the they're whole just package. not understanding. It's the whole package that's yeah. the problem. It's the prohibition, the concept yeah. of prohibition that's the problem. That's the problem. You know, thou shalt not. Fuck yeah. you. Yeah, you know? totally. And How dare there's they, all sorts you know? of, other than just the emotive anti-authoritarian response, there's all sorts of really sensible, logical, yeah. practical reasons why they should just do away with that headspace. It is so simple for me. Laws. You know, the best pain relieving plants in the creation are all made illegal so they can control pain relief mm. pain relief is the game yeah. make people feel good they yeah. give you the shirt off their back you know and it's all twisted and you know it's it, it'll dribble to an end hopefully it dribbles soon how many people have died because of the drug war yeah. weed in me no one's died from the plant no people dying in jail yeah, no, it's a serious war, and I can see why politicians don't want to talk about it, because it is a war. They don't really want to 
say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're at war with yeah. our own people, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not about the plants, really. No, no, no. Yeah, it's there's, there's other big, uh, yeah. bigger, you know, well, um, you know, the it's money, origins man. of prohibition as well, the racism of it yeah. all. Yeah. In the as US long as there's interests yeah. like Sky Media or Murdoch yeah. or, you know, the various... Mm. What yeah. would you do to get Murdoch a decent cookie, eh? Anyway, it's... I was uh, hoping Jerry Hall would get into uh, OD on Viagra. You think something. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Michael, you're part of a campaign at the moment, uh, the new, or the newish... Um, the Hemp Party hemp now changed its name to Legalised Cannabis. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got people running in the Senate across Australia, and I think we're just trying to get it on the agenda, you know, and... And send a message to the government. You can vote one for legalised cannabis, then vote for whoever you like, because it's noticeable cannabis users are from all walks of life. And people, it's people who have discovered it's a terrific medicine. It took me a long time to realise Nimbin has heaps of alcoholics who don't drink and epileptics who don't have seizures and <laughs> people with PTSD who aren't furious all day. I mean, we're, it's an outdoor hospital, you know, smoking weed. A lot of Nimbin, ironically. And the fact that we're still criminals and, you know, anyone can go to a doctor and get it legal, it's just it's too stupid for me now. And it's tragic that we can't get... The police should be backing us, you know, but it's, it's, it's their jobs are at stake. And Big Pharma is the major lobbyist in Canberra. I remember reading in America, in Washington, there's two permanent Big Pharma lobbyists in Washington for every senator. It'll be similar in Canberra. Yeah, wow. This is the big money, we, you know. We yeah. can't get weed legal. Lines, They'll lose a fortune. The gases and the miners will probably give them a run for their money. Yeah, yeah. well, they're it's even investing in weed now, aren't they? Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, it's a corporate, the corporate takeover. Yeah, it is. It's the corporatisation of weed, the pharmace pharmaceuticalisation of, of cannabis. Really. Yeah, well, there's big cannabis. Yeah, big cannabis. Um, right. Some of the... Yeah. most highly paid C business you know CEOs yeah. in Canada apparently yeah. in the last year were cannabis CEOs yeah, yeah. so yeah it's uh, it's totally yeah. up there now with uh, big business yeah. um, you know talk about cops losing their jobs like once again uh, that's not totally true uh, because we've now had legal cannabis in quite a few places around the world like say Colorado now 10 years there's still police forces yeah, <laughs> waiting for them to do because <laughs> I, yeah. I think what happens with um, and I've noticed this with California as well um, the shift like they've still got plenty of heads to bust because um, you know there's certain rules then to do with legal cannabis mm. so you can basically go and arrest the people that aren't abiding by those legal yeah. cannabis rules so no no it's just um in some ways, it is just shifting it towards more social justice. Mm. That yeah, that the police, for instance, can't just go and grab someone because they lit up a joint. Mm. It's because um, we're still in Australia dealing with such uh, like over the top reactions to mm. really petty activities. Yeah, yeah. And it's the culture wars. Yes, and yeah. and, uh, and remember Bob's early thing: bad laws breed disrespect, and oh, yeah. there's total disrespect out there for the cops now. I mean, whole generations, you know, yeah. and they're going to have to claw that back. And it'll take a long time. Yeah, it's just you know. Well, it's um, it's the absurdity of it's only due to your interest in cannabis that you're a criminal. Yeah. Yeah, so the rest of your life is totally, whatever, caught up in the Decent whole, uh, people. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, the absurdity of that is, um, is yeah. yeah, unfortunate. And the social, the, the consequences, which, you know, this is the plant we could grow in our backyard. And uh, Mardi Gras actually does have an opening as well that um, is really the uh, the uh, hemp Olympic torch arriving to right. commemorate right. all the victims of the drug war. Yeah, a I minute mean, silence yeah. for the victims of the drug war. And and lately the Lismore Mayor has been opening Mardi Gras. I don't know how we'll go with the new guy this year. I better invite him. That'll be interesting. Mm. See if he's up to it. Yeah, because often uh, the mayor has been supportive, um, yeah. definitely in recent years of Mardi Gras. Mm, so, yeah. Yeah. And ironically, of course, in this area, it's one of the major tourist... Tourist dollars. Yeah, but um, it's, you know, it's interesting that even with that fact, there's still opposition to it. 
you know, from the, the powers that be. Because mm. usually money is what is the tipping point to yeah. make something uh, acceptable. That's what happened in Nimbin, wasn't it? There was a lot of resistance from some locals early to mm. Mardi Gras, and then the shops did so well. Yeah, there's been big changes internationally with cannabis laws. Yeah. You know, with uh, Canada. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's legal for yeah. those who enjoy it. What What's are they calling it? Adult use. Adult use. What's wrong with us? Yeah, so how do you, yeah, how, do you see, how do you see Australia's laws evolving? I, I must admit I feel a bit negative. Um, David Halpin, the magistrate, did a talk at Mardi Gras last year saying that Australia will be the last yeah. place on earth to change its laws, yeah. Why? Because we're, we're essentially, a, we're, we've grown out of being a cop, convict colony and essentially most of our legislation, a lot of our whole setup, uh, certainly our um, constitutional setup, is still sort of based on that. No Bill of Rights. No, no real anything. Yeah. Beyond well, we, the, beyond we were the last to get done. Settled, settled really. Yeah. So by we, then they'd worked we it were, out, give them no chance. We There's no really, real people here. Yeah. Terra nullius. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and they just set it up as a convict colony and then gave us federation at a certain point in time. Um, but it's didn't really give that. much in the well, I don't know. That that's a good right. I reckon really, that's but, a good right. It didn't really, mm. it, it's set up as, and, and certainly historically and sociologically and just purely culturally, it's always been, you know, kind of a colony. And the cops have always been in this kind of jail, jail keeper situation with a large segment of, of the the poorer population and certainly indigenous population and, and come the 70s and 80s in this region, the alternative population. And New South Wales, the oldest police force on earth. Yeah, they say, and, from and the rubber rum rebellion, from rum, rum rebellion onwards, yeah. you know, and it's, so it's it's a really flawed model to be trying to expect legal change within. And you, over and above that, you have got this weird mixture of things that grew out of the sixties, seventies, change. You know, the culture wars. That there's yeah. definitely a third of the population that thinks that all of the cultural changes that came out of that grew out of the sixties were good things. And there's still a third of the population that thinks they are fucking terrible things. Yeah. And the world's gone crazy ever since about 1967. Yeah. Or in the seventies and this well, it's women's threatening. lib, gay rights, mm. fucking Aboriginal rights, mm. environment. All that's just crazy talk. And it's right? threatened, threatened their, all of, their old structures. There's a lot of them, and that's still a, mm. a major cultural mm. thrust that elements of the fucking National Party and the libs and and the Labor, all of them are still pushing from that point of view. And, I actually think drug, weed is helping. Weed helps, but now. it's still just part of that. Mm. That it's not. It's not a separate. It's not really even medical in their head. They're still probably hard. That 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 wedge of the population or wedge of the police or wedge of government still probably think that the medical cannabis thing is a whole blag so, they, so those hippies can smoke pot. Yeah, so what I've seen changing is the number of people who, who now are totally straight, desperate, last resort, that, that's they've tried yeah. weed, it was a miracle for yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. They get their best night's sleep yeah. in months. Yeah. Lots of that I'm discovering in them and people yeah. who finally, you know, they have a go, because it's been yeah. made legal, yeah. we'll try it. Yeah. Wow. This is Some people yeah. get angry. I've been suffering 40 years. I wish I'd known about that. Well, That's yeah. not uncommon. Don't follow so we're going to hang in. So I like what you're saying. That I always think we were, Australia was the last place settled. You know, the blackfellas weren't real people. We'll give you no rights. Yeah. So we're going to be hanging in on Mardi Gras for another 30 years, maybe. But anyway, we're hanging in. Could be a while. But, you know, it's... <laughs> it, because uh, one of the catch cries is, you know, every first weekend in May until the drug, drug until laws change, change yeah. and uh, definitely they, they have changed, nah, but not good it's, enough. it's still the status quo yeah, here. Totally. They, well, like, for instance, the riot squad still comes mm. uh, and the helicopter raids still happen. Mm. Um, we're talking mm. about contemporary times. Yeah, totally. yes. So, the, yeah, the reaction... The jail um, figures and arrest rates have not changed in Australia. Mm. Yeah. There's, there's many or more people in jail, more arrests. Bullshit. Yeah. No attitude change, really. No. So yeah, and, and Mardi Gras is intrinsic, intrinsic, you know, is part of the hemp embassy, really, isn't it? They both kind of started together. Mm. The embassy backs it, really. I, I see the embassy and Mardi Gras very much so as a community thing. Like Nimbin owns it, really. 
Mm. I, I always feel like that about Mardi Gras. Lots of people come out of nowhere to do jobs. We, I hardly see them all year. They'll turn up, they'll play their role, Heidi, with the Jungle Patrol, yeah. for example, which is, you know, doing our own... And not security. to mention the, jung- uh, the Gunja Fairies. And Gunja Fairies, who, you know, they'll be there again. So, you know, over 30 years it's evolved as our community kind of annual celebration, was a harvest celebration, and all these people just a part of it and they quietly smoke pot if they don't smoke pot they've all got friends who smoke pot around here so they get it and they get you know how important it is most people are not seeing how big prohibition is it's huge I I think you know once again, if you're living in in, in the main, mainstream part of suburban urban yeah. life, doesn't touch it, you. It doesn't really touch you. I think it does. You are touch a bong head. You know? mm-hmm. Even if you have got a room yeah. and yet your suburban house where you pull bongs and yeah. you know. They think it doesn't touch them. They don't leave their door unlocked at night. Your kid, your kids might get affected if their kid gets busted yeah. because youth the youth. Yeah. Pothead crowd are, are targeted in the same way that hippies or, or yeah. Aboriginals have always been targeted. And pot's the easy bust, bulky, oh. smelly. It's it, it's actually encouraged ice yeah. use in Australia. Yeah. And interesting, they do, you know, how they test everyone's wastewater. Mm. So the latest tests in Canberra showed a s- s- increase, sharp increase in cannabis use and drop in ice use. And I reckon yeah. that's legalising weed. And we've yeah. seen it in America. If they'd let us grow our own weed and stop picking on weed, there'd be a lot less trouble with other drugs. So fortunately, a lot of cops realise it's better not to focus on weed. If you hammer yeah. weed in Nimbin, everyone's in the pub or using something. Oh, look, else. I think any any cop with any experience, yeah, unless they've got a particularly major personal bias, will have figured out a long time ago mm. that the people on pot aren't really a problem in their they're not the job. No, you know, they're just like oh yeah, they're they're. You know. The they easy might bus to get promotions. Easy bus to get the numbers up or whatever, and, and there mm. might be a certain disparagement in their attitude towards mm. potheads, but it's it's not like there's any kind of, you know, mm. watch out for him, he's a fucking psycho. <clears throat> yeah, right. You might eat all your buttons. And there's a fair bit of resentment towards the stoner who kind of wanders around doing what he likes all mm. day, perceived as that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, whereas we go to work hard all day and pay your taxes yeah. and so on. Oh, there's all of that. Yeah. That's the culture war. That's the culture war, and it's, it's you know, Murdoch again, too, in the mm-hmm. sense that a lot of those kind of attitudes are really brought... That's how it's represented. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's a disconnect from reality because, um, uh, you know, pot use is widespread. Yeah. And, and it's used a lot by people that do have a job mm-hmm. and a family and a mm-hmm. mortgage and blah, 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 yeah. as in, you know, it's kind of pretending that it's some fringe. Yeah. And, 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 and I guess part of the rollout of legal cannabis in North America and other places is um, like you know there were big publicity drives mm. to normal as to in the people it. that use it are normal. Well, you see it in the media. Yeah, it's normal. As in just yeah. yeah, it's just the girl that works at the bank yeah, yeah. or the bloke that runs the uh, you know the car wash down mm. the road or mm. yeah, yeah, it's it's not something that's uh, just the world of uh, a bunch of outlaws. Uh, that's right, outlaws. Bohemian and weirdo music <laughs> or whatever. It, well, it's yeah, it's moved a lot. It's yeah, way it, it, beyond that. And probably always has, by the way, because as we know, part of the culture wars is stereotypes yeah, yeah. and the other, yeah. the thing that you have to be frightened of yeah. and, and avoid at all costs. So this year, uh, Mardi Gras, for the first time in 30 years, is not happening on May because um, we've had a few natural disasters yes. in this area. So, yeah, um, uh for September. everyone that wants to come and join us this year, it's it's in September from 16 to 18. And the harvest is very soggy, so it will be a planting, planting ceremony. Planting, that's right. Let September, it grow. Mm-hmm. 16, free the weed. 17, 18. And, uh, and really, you know, Mardi Gras is really about, um, you know, continuing to protest these absurd laws because they are absurd. Yeah, we just keep waving changing. that flag, you know, someone yeah. will eventually notice it. Okay. It is absolutely a protest. It's good to remember that. And I think, you know, 
We have made it fun. We have made it enjoyable. It's such an international um, mm -hmm. gathering. Um, mm -hmm. or it's grown over the years. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's people from all around the world mm -hmm. come and as shown by, you know, people come and volunteer to help. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, they're from all around the planet. Yeah, the volunteers are a big part of Mardi Gras we haven't talked about. Usually yeah. there's 50-odd camped out the back of the Hemp Embassy and they're mostly international backpackers. <laughs> yeah. And that's the other um, big part of the parade has been the joint, the big joint, mm. which was originally a uh, a canvas bamboo, stu bamboo, bamboo yeah. stuffed bamboo stuff with sheets sewn together. That's right, painted and, 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 and smoke. They love the smoke machine in there with the bee smoker trying to keep it going in the rain. Oh, my God, they were the good days. And then, uh, of course, you sort of upgraded to an inflatable, inflatable joint. joint. Well, the problem was we'd go to protests and it would take, like, three hours to build the bamboo joint. You know, it was, <laughs> by then you'd been arrested and hopeless. So the inflatable one was ten minutes. I like that. Nice. Yeah. Okay, well, um, thanks very much for this great ride. Yeah, pleasure. Yep, and, uh, yep, and we'll... Uh, and thanks we'll to be... the EGA, love your work. Yeah, thanks, guys, for the yeah. uh, the voice. Um, it's a bummer that Mardi Gras isn't happening this weekend, but... Um, Book yep, it in, it middle of happen. September. That's right, come on It'll up. It'll be good, 30th year. In, in fact, some of our EGA comrades do come to Mardi yeah, Gras. Yeah, and And help yeah. us with... Um, with uh, some of the drug-free driving. Yeah. Like, as mad as it sounds, some of our EGA comrades are drug-free drivers. Well, well it's great they don't test like everything, do they? <laughs> mushrooms they have don't become test the mushrooms. very popular mushrooms <laughs> since they brought in saliva testing. I've noticed that. Very popular. I love that hippie resilience. We'll find a way. Well, we're, the vision's there. Nothing's changing. You know, we just want harmony between each other and the planet, really, yeah. don't we? Dream about a river five feet long Mighty immense but not too strong You'll be high but not for long If you're a viper I'm the king of everything I gotta be high before well, I can swing. Thank you very much to the team Lighter from tea the Nibbin Hemp Embassy uh, for that one. And I'm here now with uh, Neil with Michael and with Ms Guidance uh, from the video that you just watched and we'll be doing a little bit of a QA and a and discussion time. So thank you very much, guys. That was amazing. That was a really great chat. Um, always love hearing stories, especially about the, uh, uh, you know, the history of these events, what what went on um, that we might not have, uh, have seen, um, you know, especially for, you know, I've seen little bits and pieces of it. I was up at um, Mardi Gras, my first and only so far Mardi Gras, um, only a couple of years ago. So, you know... Uh, it's a small history, but then um, speaking to people like yourselves, uh, uh, Robbie Swan, uh, we had at a Rainbow Serpent uh, Festival uh, panel a few years ago to talk a little bit about uh, his involvement with... Aqu uh, now, was it Aquarius Festival that was at Canberra University first and then moved yeah. up to Nimbin? It was in New South Wales University. Yeah. But I think... But, yeah, no, you're right, the first one was at Canberra. And then the year after they did Nimbin. Yeah, moved um, moved up there, and that that sort of uh, kick started a lot of the the, the countercultural stuff. So th yeah, thank you guys. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, and and first of all, I hope you're um, you're all well and have survived well through the uh, horrible flooding that has been going on up there. How are how are all you know recoveries going? Are you all well? Are you all looked after? Yeah, we're good. We had to postpone Mardi Gras. So I hope everyone realised that. So it's now on September 16 to 18 weekend. There was flood damage. The, the weir got taken out in Nimbin, so the water supply was gone. There's still a lot of roads blocked, a lot of big landslides, but Lismore is another matter. Lismore is looking like, you know, I don't know if it'll ever recover in the city, actually. Yeah, I think I saw pictures of uh, water up to so first or second stories. September 16 to 18. Oh, yeah, somebody does have some uh, like some audio in the background. There might be if you if you're watching the webcast in the background, that'll be it. But just uh, just quickly, we'll uh, we'll head across to there. I'll just show you the uh, the website. Uh, the, uh, you can access this Nibbin Mardi Gras. That's with two S's on the end. Um, is the website 16th till 18th of September. Uh, 
um, and you can just head up there. It is a really great event uh, to head up to. Um, or like heaps of stuff going on, and as they were talking about during the talk, a lot of um, a lot of stuff that sort of happens a little bit more uh, organically happens uh, depending on sort of who's up there. But let's get into some of the questions, and if you do have questions, comments, discussion points that you want to get to um, during our talk, then please do drop those uh, into the uh, into the comments section uh, here, and we will get to them. Um, our first one comes from Liam, um, who asked a little earlier. Um, uh, you were discussing um, that you got the attention of some American cannabis activists, uh, law reform people, um, and that they changed the way that Nimbin grew weed. And Liam was curious, how? Uh, our, our second question uh, comes from Hexadelic. Uh, thank you to everybody who has been commenting so far. Um, Asking about what the psychedelic movement can learn from recent law changes, new legislation, um, and and the wider access uh, to cannabis, to weed, uh, in Australia of late. Uh, some lessons to impart is what Hexadelic seeks. It's been terribly hard to get heard, is my experience. You know, that's the whole reason we're, we're running the legalised cannabis people in the Senate just to try and get it on the agenda. I'm a bit of a believer in the Chinese that teaching happens by repetition. And they've had, they, you know, the, they've sold the reefer madness story so thoroughly and so well. I think back to Randolph Hearst owning the newspapers, same as Murdoch does now. You know, the media controls the game. We just, we just got to keep chipping away. Social media has been great, I reckon, you know, Hot smokers created it, sort of, and um, they spread the word as much as they can, although it's really limited. I, we, we can never advertise legalised cannabis on Facebook. you just got to keep chipping away. I think you can educate politicians, but politicians are run by their staff, I realise. You know, Greg Hunt might change from being the health minister, but the same people are in charge. It's very hard to get through to the policy. You know, the the um, pharmaceutical companies will be taking those staff out to dinner, treating them well, big parties. I remember doctors I know on the North Coast, you get, you get a holiday in Hawaii to go to a couple of talks. Take your wife, take your whole family. It's total bribery. Nothing's changed like that, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I think it's um, it's still you know very similar, if not worse. Um, you know, you start to when you do find out about these things, and as I was sort of mentioning before, the more that you you find out about politics, it feels like with all things, uh, the less you feel like you know. It gets it becomes more and more confusing how you thought it worked or how the theoretical sort of idea of a, a democracy works. It's all bollocks. Like it does not work like that at all. It's who knows who who's friends with who and who can pay for what what nice things for people, um, and unless there's you know, somebody with a, a lot of ethics and, and a very good reason to put those on the line before some uh, other uh, perhaps lower uh, brow um, uh, 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 focus, then, uh, you know, things just don't really happen. Um, and uh, th this sort of leads on to the next question that we had. Uh, and this question, I believe, was from uh, Hexadelic as well. I oh, know from BBT, thank you, in the YouTube comment section. Uh, what other external media coverage does the Legalised Cannabis Party expect to, uh, expect to be receiving uh, on the uh, weeks prior to this federal election? Um, I guess, talk to us a little bit about where legalised cannabis is at and uh, what, what you're sort of expecting uh, out of it, if you have any announcements that might be on the line. 
Well, I guess we, you know, I'll put out a few press releases. You hope they'll get picked up. They don't get picked up much. The Byron Echo will always run them. <laughs> Maybe you get something in the Northern Star, which is now the Daily Telegraph. You get a little <laughs> column somewhere. I think we will do a launch on the first. The pre-poll opens on the 9th of May. So I think we'll do a launch outside the Lismore Courthouse, try and catch the television. You know, it's it's the media is so all powerful. It's very interesting. It's that that's what it's about. Trying to get heard. We don't have lots of money to put out lots of call flutes. We don't have you know. We just don't have it. Also, the other big thing I think that came up in that talk. It's hard to get people to put their head out for legalised cannabis. Put your head up and be handing out how to votes or be speaking up for it because you do become a target. The cops yeah. are pretty ruthless. They take it all too seriously. You know, they seem to, you know, bonus points for busting anything. I, um, yeah, I really, it's easy for us in Nimbin, but anyone anywhere else, they, you know, they put their head up, they become noticed, you lose your job. So we've got a specially difficult circumstance. That's why I think social media is good. But legalised cannabis like the Hemp Party will always get 2% of the vote, pretty much, you watch, which is a significant amount. You'll see, I think we probably came fifth out of, you know, 20 parties in the last federal election, getting as many votes as Clive Palmer in some mm -hmm. places, and he spent 60 million bucks. So <laughs> it's not a lost <laughs> cause. And I think with the medical thing becoming so much more mainstream, and I think the driving laws are really pissing off a lot of people. So it'll be interesting this time to see how we go. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and that that is a really good point that um, Clive Palmer actually uh, shovels shovels money in to try and convince uh, gullible Australians across the the nation to vote for his idiot party, and um, uh, and then you have uh, a party that and it's just it's just in the name really people who um, uh, won't know anything else but they want that particular policy and, and um, I think for you know for I, I mean would you would you say that legalized cannabis is a single issue party or um, um, or does does it aspire to be a, a broader party, or are you really focusing on that? Sorry, this is my question now, we but are, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm interested. Good, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a regularly we get asked that a lot. We are a single issue party, yep. like a few parties are really trying to get that issue on the agenda. And I'm saying to people now, look, you know, you vote one legalised cannabis, you send a message to the government, and then choose whoever you know obviously the greens probably have the next best policy but if we sort of put pass all our preferences to the green half the people won't even vote for it so it's it's quite tricky so we are a single issue party and i tell you you name the subject i can tell you where the um illegality of cannabis makes a makes an impact because it's across our society everywhere yeah well uh, especially I and I asked that just because I thought it's a bit funny that some other single issue parties have uh, tried to pretend to not be single issue parties thinking that that's you know the thing that will get them votes but actually um, there is uh, success to be had in being a uh, confident single issue party especially for an issue like uh, drug law reform and especially cannabis law reform uh, that we've seen just lagging constantly and constantly like I've only been involved with this for uh, a bit over a decade now and I'm finding myself getting jaded at the repetitive political patterns uh, that we see over and over the inquiries that we have already done five other times the the discussions with politicians that are wonderful and then go nowhere it's you know <laughs> I, I, I've got to say admire admiration to you especially Michael because I know you've been uh, doing this for uh, quite a long time and you know how do you avoid how do you avoid getting jaded by the process the grind of this process yeah I'm furious I, I kind of I tell you I'm seriously furious and it probably helps that I work in Nimbin a lot and it's in my face every day. Prohibition, the consequences of it, homeless people who'd rather buy an ounce of weed a week than try and pay their rent, you know? They're, they're dealing on the street, the heroin addicts, the ice addicts, the alcoholics in Nimbin. A lot of um, alcoholics in Nimbin who smoke weed instead. You know, Nimbin's a kind of, for me, a bit of an outdoor hospital you know, everyone who uses cannabis daily like I do, there's a reason. People have reasons, you know. It's a genuine, awesome medicine that helps a lot of people. So I think, you know, just the fact it's in my face every day, the more I've learned about the drug war, the more just 
totally disgusting it is, you know. This is this should absolutely be just a health issue. It's nothing to do with it. It's just people trying to feel good, trying to have a good day, trying to have less pain. Once you see it, it's just, you know, it's just appalling. And the far-reaching ramifications, most people just don't realise how big and significant the drug war is. And it would go a long way towards helping save the planet too, you know, not just raising consciousness, but we've got a plant that's so much better than cotton, so much better than wood chipping, fantastic seed, highly nutritious, extraordinary plant in millions of ways. So, you know, we've been lied to so extensively, you know, and it gets my goat up. Yeah, I'm furious. I'll be, I'll, I, I, uh, I need the weed to keep on top of the fury. <laughs> uh, I, I noticed as well one of, one of the comments made earlier about uh, trying to capture the camera and how hard it is uh, to get the attention. Even harder now, I think, as uh, mainstream media has sort of narrowed its focus, lot, lost a lot of those really good um, sort of journalists that were actually trying to do the job of journalism rather than uh, be, you know, agents for propaganda, essentially, essentially and effectively um, for whoever the, the company is that, that buys them. That, it's 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 equally as frustrating that it's hard to capture the camera. But I see Neil that you're wearing a uh, Doctor Strange uh, t-shirt there, and it just sort of reminds yeah. me <laughs> uh, that um, that that psychedelic culture, cannabis culture, and psychedelic culture, sort of more broadly, I'm sort of combining these two a little bit, has uh, it captured the pop culture and is at the front of a lot of pop cultural projects. MCU, uh, Marvel's movies, uh, obviously being one with uh, certainly psychedelic elements in it, but lots of other pop cultural outlets i listen to a lot of um pop culture music i was formerly a commercial radio broadcaster and you know well, to see even, that i mean a favorite game i always had back in the <clears throat> 90s and early 21st century was spot the psychedelic reference in the simpsons <laughs> yeah exactly and there were plenty, yeah. of them, plenty of them how many times does homer or lisa or someone cop a good dose and 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 it's just and it's always a benign good thing. Yeah, exactly. And I'm I'm just wondering if you want to maybe talk a little bit more about that. The sort of the the cultural capital of um of altered states versus the, the the inability for us to to seem to be able to capture attention for you know hey saying hey um since we've uh, created all this culture that you know the world is reliant on now um or at least seems to enjoy a lot uh, maybe let's stop throwing us in jail. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, look, I, I've become very jaded, very cynical, I'm afraid. I, 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 it, it, be careful what you wish for because it might come true, you know. Like, I mean, having, having been involved in drug law reform my whole life, fairly actively, um, ultimately, I, you know, what, what's happening is it's corporatised and, it, and it's being... It, it's, it's going to be a very different thing. Drug culture will be a very different... Cannabis culture has is already and will become a very different thing to what I've... I've known in my life. That's history. That's life. Whatever. But I think it's kind of a bit of a worry because it's ultimately the mainstream. You know, society has a wonderful capitalism has a wonderful habit of just co-opting anything that's kind of <laughs> shining and beautiful <laughs> and um, <clears throat> marketing it, and and in the process killing it usually. And uh, I, I can see that happening in the psychedelic realm. You know, like mm. with the medicalisation. It's great. It's wonderful. It's all that. But who are the people doing it and what are their motivations and do they really have any kind of idea? Good question. Um, same thing happens with, with the cannabis thing. You look, it's a corporate thing at this point in history. So is the whole world. What are you going to do? Um, decriminalisation, self-medication, grow your own, that whole shtick is probably going to become more relevant anyway just as society crumbles and the environment caves in on us. <laughs> yeah, I agree with myself. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, um, uh, I, I, you said you made that comment in the in the video about um, uh, pretty much what you said there, and about you, you know maybe we should have just pursued decriminalisation. And yeah. you know, as I said, I'm starting to feel a similar sort of jadedness, especially you know watching the kind of um, uh, the kind of drama that unfolds. Um, uh, I've got my eye particularly on the psychedelic world, but I've w yeah. watched the cannabis yeah, world yeah. as well, and the um, yeah the drama that unfolds, the people that get involved. Involved, the questions that you start to have, the sort of the, the hollowness, the hollowness of it all. Because I think, you know, you get that, that sale, sale, sale thing and you get people who are really good at just 
um, are doing this thing where they're like, they've noticed somebody else who is talented um, and they go, okay, I'm going to copy that exactly and do nothing with it um, because I know that like, oh, you know, that joke made a bunch of people laugh, so I'll just copy it exactly. It's no, you know, there's nothing in it. <laughs> it's just like, I have noticed the thing that gets the attention. Oh, what was, was that a pigeon? Sorry, I, I, I get distracted by bird-like objects, Michael, so you got to understand this. No, it's a cat. <laughs> it looked very beakish there. I mean, cats as well. How is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michael couldn't figure out how to turn his camera exactly. around. So. The carpet snake broke it today in the house. It fell down. Caroline's mended it, so it's on the table. <laughs> you know, talking about the Simpsons... <laughs> Talking about The Simpsons, I, I, reckon, <laughs> peep, I don't know how many people realise that Walt Disney and his brother went down to Mexico, had peyote. You know, my experience of mescaline, but one of my best experiences ever with, with psychedelics was a double mescaline trip where everyone turned into cartoon characters, perfect for who they were. <laughs> Walt Disney comes back with his brother and starts drawing his visions. That's the entire cartoon history world you know <laughs> that's where we end up that's with mary amazing. poppins <laughs> i don't know how many people know that <laughs> no, I mean it's stories like that, I and never knew that. interwoven yeah. <laughs> through the through the pop culture, especially you know Hollywood for all of the the evils that come out of that <laughs> giant cultural um, behemoth as well. There does seem to be a you know pretty strong uh, altered states history going on there. Yeah, always has been. You yeah. know, always has been. Um, uh, by the way, in the YouTube comment section, now we have people dropping in uh, various different Simpson scenes that they can remember with uh, with psychedelic references. So we've got the roast chicken. Um, yeah, I think I remember. It. Yeah, the mescaline chili, obviously. Um, Homer's cas uh, castanada journey. Bart's pencil holder. I don't remember Bart's pencil holder. Was it a bong? Kane a dropping bong. that one in. Yeah, um, I, he bought a pencil holder at a market. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, now we've got another question as well uh, in the comment section again from Hexadelic asking uh, asking what are a couple of things uh, people can do to help the movement uh, when when they're you know when they're stuck in the sort of nine to five system in the city. Um, what? Yeah, I guess some advice for <laughs> from our friends in the in the bush. <laughs> We, in, in the current election, you could go to that website, legalise.org.au, and I'm pretty sure you can print a poster from there. Anyone's welcome, you know, any chance you've got to do that, to put them up, to spread the word. It's more a matter of people realising, oh, yeah, legalised cannabis, I can vote for them. It give them the option so they can see it before they go into the, uh, you know, into the voting booth. One of the good things about the election is no one sees you in their voting so you are totally anonymous you know the paranoia about smoking weed is as high as ever it's pretty um yeah it's a huge factor in the stigma as you you talk about so you just spread the word talk to your mates put stuff on the web social media print a poster join the party come to mardi gras yeah, I'm just I'm just having a look at the website now, and I, I know there's very specific rules around sharing uh, um, election material. Uh, generally, during you know, I'm I'm going by you know our media rules in Australia, but I don't know if YouTube just doesn't care as much. But you know, uh, I'll just scroll down to the bottom no. so you can <laughs> have a look no, at the. No, the cannabis thing is really tricky on the web, and people get blarred and blocked and so on. Yeah, so. exactly. But I'm looking at the website now. Don't want to tell you how to vote. You vote for whoever. You, you want to vote for but go check out the uh, legalized cannabis party there's an authorization so you know <laughs> got that but uh yeah you can have a look at, uh, at some the of the rules you, you don't have to put who printed it which is a big change because you used to have to mm. put whoever printed it and i think that's just changed so people can just print it Yes, yeah, I remember that. That's yeah. So check that out. But yeah, as you said, Mardi Gras is going to be happening in uh, in September now. Um, so obviously everything will be uh, you know back up. Uh, everybody will be a little bit more settled after uh, after a very um, tricky end of summer. Uh, hopefully winter's fine. Generally, it seems to not <laughs> rain as much during winter, or still rains as much. But I don't know why does it flood? There. Sorry, this is a side question. I'm going on a side quest here, but. <laughs> Yeah, are you going to get a lot of rain over winter is what I'm asking? <laughs> Who knows? It's just got very wet again, Nick, after, you know, a drought going on for a long time. Mm. So, 
I'll ask the weather god, sorry about um, uh, questions that you probably have no answer to. But let's talk about Mardi Gras a little bit. Um, what's what's planned so far? What, what have you got uh, in store or is it uh, is it still in a sort of uh, planning um, stage? Um, any any hopes for, for things that you want to see there? No, we had it pretty planned, didn't we, Kath? We had yeah. a pretty we had the program pretty much sorted. Great lineup of speakers. All the usual other events were on. And then you know, so you know, I will so enjoy this weekend, which is meant to be Mardi Gras, because <laughs> the pressure's off totally. And we'll definitely have just between us, a bit of a small, private, local Mardi Gras, because already a few people have turned up who flew into Australia and arranged their tickets to be at Mardi Gras. So we can't disappoint them. So we'll definitely be uh, rolling up the street on Sunday afternoon. And the cabaret is on tomorrow night still. And there's a little doof on Saturday night. So it'll be a bit of a tiny local Mardi Gras, not to disappoint people who have come a long way. Didn't know the dates had changed. I think we've got a great program, and between now and September, it will only get better. In fact, it's already, isn't it, Kath? We've had misguidance. We've already had a couple of more people join the speakers. It'll be good. And it's the 30th Mardi Gras. It's a bit of a milestone. Mm. Be interesting to see who wins the election. Whoever wins the election, I'll be harassing them to make some effort. I think, yeah, I reckon it'll be good. And it'll be, you know, we've often had wet Mardi Grasses because it is May, early, first weekend in May is kind of the tail end of the wet season. This year they're predicting it'll go further, but hopefully September it'll be a spring planting ceremony. It'll be good. Yeah, and the last, um, like Mardi Gras last year and, and now this year is really focusing on Australia as well, like Australian contributors. So uh, to me, that worked really lovely last year. It was a really great event. Um, yeah, just sort of like not worrying about international people coming and sharing necessarily and uh, just sticking to what the, uh, the local crew can offer. So... Yeah, it sort of felt like a bit more of a, a local event, a local event for local people. <laughs> um, but, yeah, Nick, general, please, <laughs> Nick, please come on up again. Yeah, oh yeah, I'd love to get up there again. Um, uh, I think the last time I was up in that region was... Um, last time i was there um my partner was just up at uh up at uh um blues fest so you know not too far away um but yeah i think we can get it bring the whole family up there because it is it's a family event as well i think you know people like to associate you know oh it's drugs it's over 18 it's like well don't give them to your children like <laughs> you know be 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 sensible please <laughs> Um, well, I mean, that's um, an interesting thing too because there's always this uh, fear of uh, what children being around pot smokers hmm. and it's like, what do they expect? Are we going to grow like horns and eat their children? As in, it's just really odd because as we are well aware, um, pot smokers are usually sitting around relaxed, like Neil here. <laughs> well, yeah, and, um, like, and you know, like and often... as in it, it's the um, yeah, they're very relaxed and and um, and you know, events that are really full of great creativity and joy. It's kind of like what what is cannabis all about? Yeah, um, exactly. You know, and... Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's a really special, a really special gathering. You're right about speakers change. The pandemic sort of did that, didn't it? But we used to sort of, you know, spend lots of our hard-earned money bringing in speakers from America or Canada or Europe. And and now the local culture is right up on it all. And I reckon the talks last year in the Hemposium in the hall were as popular as I've ever seen. The hall was packed for lots of the good talks. They were excellent. You know, the other thing we didn't talk about was comedy. (laughs) <laughs> Comedy's become a really big part of Mardi Gras. There's a whole crew that comes from Sydney every year, as well as the Hemp Olympics and the Sorensen Glover show Saturday night. And I noticed that that has really become the most popular thing. And it, it kind of, you know, not only does weed fuel for your imagination, help with your sense of humour, but um, I think it's the times, you know? It's a great time for comedy and 
You know, what a way to not think about the war on drugs or turn it on its head and have a laugh about it. So I don't think we mentioned that in the in the talk movie, but the last few years, that's become a really, really popular part of Mardi Gras. Yeah, I think you touched on the, the comedians a little bit, but that is a really good point because that was one one of my highlights when I was up at uh, Mardi Gras. The, the comedy was... Uh, well, I think <laughs> I think um, maybe I wasn't sure where my expectations were, um, but they were um, uh, blown away. Um, yeah, it's very good. <laughs> so yeah, uh, a, very good. a question uh, from Ronnie, uh, for, uh, wondering, will we see the Mardi Gras crew down at EGA in December? Garden States. <laughs> you guys going to come um, down? Yeah, we're actually... And there's a few other people definitely from the embassy that want to come. So, yep. Yeah, there's a good chance. I'm a huge fan of, of the entheogenic world and actually would love to come. No, I haven't really put my head into it. It's in December, isn't it? December, yeah. December? Got a bit of time to think about it. We'll come, we'll come up where to... About, where is it? Where is it? It's in Melbourne. Um, yeah, it not in not an outdoor. Uh, sorry. In the city, I loved it when you had it out in the hills near the Eildon Weir. It's Weir. it's also my. Fa- I think everybody's favourite is uh is when it's um the big <laughs> outdoor one. But um, we Ronnie's got a bit of well, he's got a bit of hair left, and uh, actually no, it's still doing still doing pretty well. But I know those uh those events are the much more um hair pulling ones, <laughs> getting uh, thousands of people out um out of hey, town. Um, Nimbin would be a great place to do EGA one year as well. It would be. It'd be yeah, a bit of bit of travel for us um, <laughs> Melbourneites, but uh... no, fly, you know, with Gold Coast Airport or Ballina Airport are really close to Nimbin. But I, anyway, I would love to come down in December. That's that's a good plan. Excellent. Well, we'll come up to you in in September, and then we'll remind you as well, and then you can come down okay. in December. Um, and the website again, Nimbin Mardi Gras to uh, s dot com. Uh, please do go check that out, and there is heaps of content um, as well uh, available on. There's a few YouTube channels that Mardi Gras has sort of had. Uh, I've noticed o- over time, but the Hemposium uh, channel has a lot of the fantastic talks um, that uh, Ms. Guidance has been uh, guiding over the many years um and uh, yeah lots of good content up there and as you saw as well i mean neil uh, i i imagine that's you digitizing a lot of the uh the the old footage um which is just beautiful to see yes some of it me um some of it uh by the uh, hungarian filmmaker whose, whose footage we used who had contemporary footage as well it was, it was done really quickly just in the last couple of days right wow but yeah, well, there's, there is actually quite a lot of um, footage from the first two or three Mardi Gras that I've got to get digitised somewhere or other. Yeah, like no, because it's say there'd be shitloads of other stuff from the last, you know, ten or twenty years. It's always fantastic to see that kind of stuff. I think, you know, people that were there uh, love to be reminded of it and people that weren't love to be reminded that this stuff has been going on, on, on a lot longer uh, than people think because, uh, you know, I think that's one of the one of the things that I come across sometimes, um, and we probably all do, um, you know, you think when you first discover these sorts of things, you think it's all fairly new uh, and it's really great to have that archival stuff and go, well, you know, here's what people were doing 40 years ago and hear those same every conversations. Every generation's got to re- recreate itself, so that's a fair enough kind of yeah kind of call. yeah but yeah it, it's it's so good if you can learn if you can look at a previous generation's shtick and go that's good that's garbage that's gar- that's good you know and actually not just holus bolus ignore it or or, or diss it build on it it builds build on a, it. take the bits from it that work build something and, intergenerational put it yeah put it together and and try try some other experiments see if that do or don't work because i mean ultimately that's what a lot of the so do go find the um, the YouTube channels. You won't find all that archival stuff on YouTube, but maybe one day. But there's heaps of stuff uh, from the past few talks uh, on there. And thank you very much, Neil, uh, Michael, and Ms. Guidance for uh, that wonderful talk and for uh, being here for a bit of Q and A tonight. Do stick around because we have uh, a video from uh, Liam uh, who will be talking uh, about. I think it's a, a vaping video, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it at first uh, at the same time as you are. Um, yeah, thanks very much, guys. We look forward to seeing you in september thanks nick thanks, thanks nick. very much love your work 
and we'll jump straight in to uh, Liam's video. Uh, here it is. This is the EGA uh, Microdose webcast number 14. Uh, we are live, so keep those uh, comments going and discussion in the comment section. Um, and thanks for joining us. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already as well. Hi, my name is Dr. Liam Engel. I'm an ethnobotanist and I research illicit drugs. Today, I'm going to talk to you about cannabis, specifically uh, vaporization and cannabis concentrates. I'd like to emphasize that cannabis containing THC isn't legal without a prescription in Australia. I'd also like to mention that EGA have uh, created a resource on cannabis concentrates that is kind of a backbone for a lot of the information presented here. So if you like the subject and you want some more information, I really recommend that you check it out. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about cannabis, specifically concentrates and vaping, which are two increasingly popular cannabis technologies. And I'm gonna talk about them from the perspective of harm reduction uh, in the hopes that this information can help people increase the benefits or you know, minimize the harms of, of their cannabis use. So I've given some long definitions here to give you maybe a more simple version of each. Basically, vaporization is about heating cannabis to low temperatures. So you can still inhale it like smoking, but unlike smoking, the plant material doesn't combust. And this reduces some of the harms associated with smoking cannabis. We're not exactly sure how this reduces the harms because vaping hasn't really been studied enough for us to directly compare the two, but people report a lot of um, benefits from vaping uh, after switching to vaping from smoking. Cannabis concentrates, on the other hand, uh, I think a good way to envision them is similarly, uh, they are kind of like what spirits are to beer. They're a more concentrated form of cannabis. Um, typically, this is meant, you know, more concentrated form of THC, but they're all forms of cannabis concentrates out there. Um, some might have concentrated amounts of CBD, some might have concentrated amounts of flavonoids or terpenes, and, and they all will have different combinations of these um, different ingredients depending on uh, what cannabis is used and how the concentrate is made. Um, so I'm kind of giving you some dot points in the history of vaporizing here. A lot of people think that it's kind of a recent phenomenon because it was popularized by e-cigarettes um, around about 2003, but vaping has actually been around for ages. Um, so it's concentrates. Uh, the, I think the oldest example of concentrates being consumed is bung, which is like a, a, a kind of dairy Indian drink uh, in which um, hash or, or sometimes cannabis flour it is put. Um, and then there are also this really old evidence of um, vaping in Scythian bathhouses, which were basically um, uh, cannabis plants were placed over hot coals underneath and the vapor filled the bathhouse with steam. Um, sounds pretty fun. Uh, and also the history of water pipes, whilst in Australia, this is often associated with bongs, um, in which are typically smoked. Uh, if you can think of more like hookah style smoking, in which they often use hot coals, this is another kind of form of vaping in the way that it's indirect heat, not flame heating the material being inhaled. Um, and so this is another form of vaporization. Um, this is some wild cannabis that I saw in Manali, which is in India in a place called the Pavadi Valley. The people here have been making hash for a really long time. Some of the people there say they can trace their lineage back to Alexander the Great. Uh, and uh, the, the term people use is, is Manali cream. Uh, people often in India kind of hail that as one of the best forms of, of hashish that's there. And this is like a not a solvent hash. Typically it's produced um, using machinery or from people's hands. So it might be a bit less clean than dabs or, or some of the other types of solvent hash we'll talk about in a sec. Um, but in terms of vaporizers, I, I did this little chart because I think people get uh, overwhelmed by what vaporizers are. And like I was saying before, it's actually a very simple technology. You are, you're not smoking it, but it's like smoking it without burning it. Uh, and, you know, when people put all sorts of little dials and flashing lights and stuff on their vaporizer, it seems like it's all getting very high tech. But really, keep in mind, it's just this similar uh, technology in which we're heating something to a low temperature. 
And so you can do this with flames. You can even do this with a bong. I said a bong earlier wasn't vaporizing, but if someone held their lighter far enough away from the weed without burning it, you could vape it a little bit, um, but it would kind of be a difficult technique. Um, and, and if you did that, we might call that a flame-operated dry herb vaporizer. Um, you've also probably seen on the internet dabbing where people um, heat a nail or a bit of metal and then put a cannabis concentrate, a dab on that and then smoke that through a water pipe. We could also consider that another type of flame-operated um, vaporizer. I think more commonly, though, people are using electric vaporizers. The one most people have seen are uh, e-cigarettes, which, which often will have a tank. And if they don't have a tank, then people will be dripping the e-liquid directly onto a coil, um, which, which kind of heats up from a battery. You know, it looks like a little spring and uh, it, it contains like um, a wick. And that wick absorbs the liquid either from the tank or the liquid that you drip onto it. It's a little bit tricky using e-cigarettes um, with cannabis concentrates uh, because people have trouble making the cannabis concentrate dissolve in the e-juice liquid. Um, I'll go into that in a bit more detail later. Um, uh, popular dry herb electric vaporizer, everyone's seen the Volcano, to stores and Bickle product, um, just so I'm not plugging one, one brand. A, a cool... Uh, um, Oh no, this, this is a flame one, but a cool cheap vaporizer um, I, I would like to recommend is called the DynaVape. It might not be as effective at reducing harm as an electric vaporizer because electric vaporizer often will let you control the temperature to the degree, which helps you reduce the likelihood of inhaling benzene. But um, the DynaVape product is incredibly cheap flame operated vaporizer. It's like $100. And I think it's a good way of showing people how simple the technology is and making it more accessible. You know, not everyone has half a grand to, to drop on it, something to inhale cannabis. Um, and there's electric dabbing too. Um, often a, a product is called an e-nail, which is much like the nail that someone might heat up with a butane torch for flame operated dabbing, um, but instead it plugs into the wall. And often you can set these to a specific temperature setting too. Um, so quick rundown of the kind of key dot points I think are important for people that are vaping cannabis or in vaping in general and how they might, you know, reduce harm around in their use. The first one I mentioned before um, is to reduce the amount of benzene that's being inhaled. And we understand that this is something that is often produced at temperatures over 200 degrees. Uh, and thus the, the simple solution is keep your temperature below 200 degrees. Ideally, the lower you can get the temperature while still getting the effect you want, the better. So I, I definitely encourage you to play around with how low can you get your vaporizer and still get the effects that you want. Um, of course, the less harmful vaporizer is the cleaner vaporizer um, because you're inhaling less gunk. You know, the less stuff that you inhale, the better. So um, yeah, uh, and the more accurately controlled temperature, which like I was saying, this is the advantage of electric electric vaporizers over flame. It's, it's easier to be very, very strict on what temperature you're heating to. Um, also, you know, vaping e-juice or, or vaping anything, typically it's going to be more healthy to eat the substance than vaping it or, or smoking it just because your stomach is less sensitive than your lungs and your body is going to have an easier time processing whatever you're consuming by eating than whatever you're consuming by inhaling. Um, yeah, um, the less harmful e-juice and e-cigarette is made in accordance with third-party manufacturer standards. So some countries have rules and regulations for creating e-juice uh, and others don't. So obviously a country that is kind of forcing manufacturers to operate to certain standards is going to be, is going to be better because you're going to have less likelihood that there's contaminants or dodgy things happening in your process. Um, the less harmful e-juice to vape is a strong e-juice. But this is complicated because a strong e-juice is also going to be harsher on your throat. It's also going to have an increased likelihood of overdose of you having too much. Um, but the logic of the less harmful e-juice being a stronger e-juice is a logic that, like we said before, the less you inhale, the better. So the less you're mixing it with other stuff, the less you're inhaling stuff besides the psychoactive substance that you're committed to inhaling, the better. Um, so, so making a potent thing to inhale is a good way of reducing the quantity of things that you're inhaling. Um, except of course, this can increase tolerance and can snowball into, you know, you consuming more than or as much as you would have anyway. 
Um, yeah, in Australia, uh, it is legal to sell e-cigarettes, the, the technology and, and other vaporizers, but it's not legal to sell the nicotine that puts in them. I think it's also legal to sell, to sell the e-juice, um, but it's the nicotine that is illegal. There's recently been some policy changes where you can get nicotine, but you have to have a prescription from your GP. Um, so it's, 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 it can be a little tricky to access, but there is some, some access. Um, so the link between cannabis concentrates and vaping, I think, is, is dabbing, hot knifing, or freebasing, um, because these are all methods that are commonly used to vaporize cannabis concentrates and often used to vaporize other substances. Typically, content to, to value this more, and it's there's less additional material, so it's easier to heat it to a low temperature um, to get the desired effect. This is a list of the common types of um, cannabis concentrates you might find on the black market. Uh, the most common one, I think, but particularly um, throughout Europe, uh, is chocolate hash. And this will be the most traditionally common form. You know, it looks like chocolate. If you rub your hands together and you get little black balls uh, of, of, of kind of dead skin, that's what it looks like. Um, because oftentimes, you know, there's a good component of your chocolate hash that is that that dead skin because it's made literally by by doing that action um, after someone has been picking cannabis. Not always, but often. Um, Kefirs, you know, might be what someone finds at the bottom of a bag of cannabis, or often people have grinders that have a little sieve in them. So as you grind the cannabis, the thinnest parts get separated out, and this this thinner part might be considered keef. Bubble hash is pretty much the same thing, but you're using water or ice in addition as a solvent rather than just sifting it. So uh, usually people use bubble bags, which are in kind of different grades of mesh going from uh, larger to finer. And depending on which bag it falls into, it will um, affect presumably the, the grade of the cannabis with people kind of tending to guess that the finer grade is the better quality. Um, rosin hash um, is something that a uh, kind of classic DIY hash. People are, uh, are doing it, I think, to quite great effect too. I'm not sure how much uh, cannabis concentrates on the legal market would be produced by a rosin because I'm, I'm not sure if it's the most effective extraction technique. But basically people, you know, the, the easy way to understand how it works is people are doing it at home, getting some baking paper and putting that in between a hair straightener or using an iron. And then that heat uh, strips the cannabis resin onto the paper. And then after you remove the cannabis from within the paper, you've got some um, kind of resinous looking cannabis concentrate, which is the, um, you know, the, um, it's the, the resin that's come directly off the cannabis because that's what a cannabis concentrate is. It's a, it's a cannabis resin. And I think in my understanding, the cannabis plant exudes the resin to help protect it from the sun. And whilst there are other cannabinoids um, contained in the plant, I think a vast majority of the THC, at least by weight, is contained within that cannabis resin, um, which you can extract with rosin. Um, BHO, I think, is, is, is probably the most commonly consumed type of dab, at least on the black market. Um, butane is basically just run in a column over the cannabis. It drains out the end and it evaporates really quickly to leave to leave the resin there. Um, butane is popular because it's not a very um, uh, rough solvent, unlike um, other, other solvents like ethanol, which is what's used in Rick Simpson's oil, the final example. And that can pull stuff like chlorophyll too, unless people are going to additional kind of effort to keep their ethanol cold or, or do a variety of things to make it pull less stuff besides cannabinoids from, from your cannabis. Uh, but uh, in, in the labs, in a medical context, I don't think either ethanol or butane are, are typically being, being used. Maybe, maybe they are in certain contexts, um, but stuff like supercritical CO2, it's better CO2, it's very expensive to use, but it's very clean, um, very clean solvent. Uh, here's some images of cannabis concentrates. You can't always tell just by what they look like, what they are, but we can kind of make a loose guess. So in that uh, that far left image, that kind of yellow looking one, I reckon there's a good chance that that's that's Keith, um, just because it looks like um, there's some impurities in there. 
but it doesn't have quite as many impurities as those other two images immediately next to it, the brown one or the green one. I think the top one, that's an example of chocolate hash, probably has some stuff on there from machinery or people's hands. And the bottom one, it could well be the same, but it looks a bit cleaner. Perhaps it's bubble hash. Perhaps it's something else. Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. It, it, it looks like it's had some weird processing. On the right, we can't tell between different types. I think the one at the top, maybe it's just a denser photo, so it looks darker, but as a general rule, maybe we'd assume that these more uh, solvent hash dab type looking products, uh, the darker it is, or especially the greener it is, the less pure it is. Um, because that's, you know, the sign of chlorophyll and other impurities getting in there. A nice amber colour is often the mark of a very high quality concentrate. Um, tips on cannabis concentrates, reducing your harm and maximising the benefits. Like I was saying before, it's always better to eat than inhale, but uh, you can overdose when you eat. And that is particularly easy with cannabis, um, particularly uh, because it takes such a long time to kick in, people have a tendency to redose. And I would suggest waiting at least two hours before redosing if you're worried a, a cannabis edible hasn't been potent enough. Um, uh, the less harmful cannabis concentrate contains a less plant material, solvents and other impurities. So it's that same rule, the less stuff you're inhaling, the better. So strong stuff is good because you need to inhale less quantity of stuff. Um, stuff in which solvent has not been uh, evaporated entirely, um, is not good because, you know, inhaling extra butane or fumes of ethanol is probably not good for your lungs. Um, the same goes for inhaling fat diluted cannabinoids, which is like uh, if you'd received an edible product, um, often cannabis extracts um, or even cannabis flour is put into um, like coconut oil or olive oil or butter and people use that to eat. Don't smoke that. Don't smoke. Um, uh, don't smoke lipids. It, it can be. Uh, I think it's. I think it can produce something called oh, some something that's very like pneumonia. But it's not good. Don't don't heat and inhale that. Um, it's illegal to have any THC containing product in Australia, but it is surprisingly easy to get a prescription provided that. Uh, you have a condition that's eligible and you've tried other medications in the past. Uh, and if you were going to pursue such a thing, I'd really encourage you to go through a cannabis clinic rather than a GP because cannabis clinics are often much more familiar with this whole context and are less likely to have stigma about your personal kind of preference. Um, CBD is accessible. Uh, not all pharmacies have it, but you can get it. Um, and uh, terpene and flavonoid products, which affect the taste. And, and, and there seems to be some psychoactive effect, although I think we don't understand a whole lot about them. Uh, they, they are legal. And um, a friend of EGA, Torsten Weedman, actually, actually makes them, I think, or perhaps he has a colleague who makes them. But either way, it's very cool, very interesting, particularly when people are adding these things to cannabis concentrates, both for flavour and for maybe some kind of entourage effect. Um, and just the complexity of, of cannabis and the different components of it and how those components come together to influence the effect is something that really hasn't been explored in entirety. So um, this terpene and flavonoid products are a legal way to kind of, you know, investigate that. Um, this is a slide telling you to be safe and trying to keep us safe. Um, so please read it. We can't tell you everything about cannabis or about entheobotanicals. Often it's very complicated space with laws and cultural interests and risks. Um, and so always do more research to keep it safe. Um, thank you. Thank you, AGA. Thank you, everyone who worked on the Cannabis Concentrates document, uh, the resource that we made for AGA, particularly Torsten, who I mentioned before. And thank you, all of you, for tuning in and supporting AGA. So to find the cannabis concentration resource, you simply go to gardenstates.org, click on about, go to resources, come down to view all our resources, and then cannabis concentrate reference guide, click on that, and it'll take you through. There's the resource guide, and there's the full URL up here if you need that. 
And thank you very much to Liam Engel for that presentation. If you want to find out more, the best place to go is the EGA website, Entheogenesis uh, Australis. Uh, well, sorry, gardenstates.org, because I'm just going to jump over here where you can see I'm on Google Maps. Uh, Nimbin Mardi Gras first. I'm going to just throw some websites out here. NimbinMardiGras.com. Uh, let's go across to Garden States. So, as I mentioned at the start of the broadcast, and if you've been here the whole time, thanks for sticking around, um, the usual uh, EGA website is just currently a placeholder. So, head to gardenstates.org. Uh, this is where you can uh, find out information about the Garden States event, December 2nd to 4th, um, and you can see some of the people that will be uh, contributors uh, in December. Uh, and it's also where you can register. Click here to register and you can register there and you'll get information about tickets as soon as that's available. Uh, and the other thing that you might like to do, oh, just close the one I needed. The other thing that you might like to do is sign up uh, for EGA's newsletter and then you'll be kept up to date with not just uh, information about Garden States uh, and um, when you know when tickets will be on sale which is very very soon uh, but also information about our upcoming webcasts uh, when resources get uh, get um, created and uh, made available to you and you can find some of those resources under about and you head to resources there um, and uh, information for example about when uh, the uh, the I, I don't know what the the plant trip sit chart the plant sit chart trip plant chart i don't know what what it's called yet i'm sure uh, a name will will arise um and that's that's a really fantastic project that will be available soon uh our, our next webcast uh at the end of may right in the heart of fungal season will be about just that it will be a uh, mushroom focused webcast so make sure um that you do sign up for that um again webcast just head to the webcast part of gardenstates.org and then you'll be able to register as soon as this one's over obviously this is about tonight's um, but you can then register and uh, get up to uh, up to date information on that webcast so please do that thank you very much uh, to everyone who has tuned in tonight live um, and provided uh, questions commentary discussion in the comment section we really appreciate it we appreciate you uh, being here and thank you to anybody who was able to make a donation to help uh, with the webcast project we appreciate all of that as well it helps go towards uh, uh resources to keep things going and 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 general costs like you know building new websites which is uh, uh one of the other big announcements that will coming will be coming up soon thank you very much please enjoy your um your where are we thursday night <laughs> and uh, make sure to go and check out uh, heaps more of that content uh over on the uh on the um uh, Mardi Gras, uh, various YouTube channels. You'll find a few out there, but the Hemposium ones are really fantastic. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs> Thank you.